Hey, everyone. Happy Saturday. Yeah. Hey, it's... No, 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 no. I wasn't trying to talk to you, sir. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is... Day 25. <laughs> Siri was like, started Day just like typing all the stuff I was saying. I was going to say it was, oh, 300 hours, 33 minutes right now. So 333. And then Siri came on and she started saying everything I was saying and Jared's... So, anyways, that was a great intro, wasn't it? So, yeah, day 25 of the Vegas shutdown. Um, and a lot of rumblings yesterday about this whole Raiders stadium. Um, it's really hard online to know what's true and what's not anymore. You know what I mean? Um, and you'll hear, like, so many... <laughs> Different things, like you'll hear one thing come up, and this one's like, "Are absolutely not the truth," and you're like, "Well, I don't know." So um, we heard there was a meeting, then we heard there wasn't a meeting, then. But at the end of the day, the Raiders Stadium is still progressing forward, so it still lines up with what I'm saying. If this was a deadly virus, then Governor Sislek would stop the Raiders Stadium, and he has not. They are still continuing. So the rumor yesterday was that it did stop, and then it, yeah, they had a, a meeting, and then they got it back going again. And I don't know if that happened for sure or not, because we have some people saying it did for sure, and other people say, no, it did not. Really hard to tell sometimes on social media and uh, even the regular news what's true and what's not. And But whenever something comes up... Um, you got to feel that there was something there, right? Because it's like, well, where did this story come out of nowhere? Because what happens usually is the workers come forward about something. And they get a little whistleblower, and then that person goes to social media and says something. And then the media outlets come out, and they go, oh, no, 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 no. Because here in Vegas, they really don't like negative news at all. They try to squash anything where it's just anything negative it's like they want the news to only be positive in Vegas and there's a lot of negative things that occur here all the time um and other cities you know tend to report on their negative things that occur but since we're an entertainment place it's like they don't want anyone to see that something negative could occur in Vegas so even like when that whole Mandalay Bay um you know, the Route 91 shooting occurred. Uh, is that what it was? It was Route 91? The Harvest Festival. Um, they didn't want to talk about it. Like, they let it go. They let people talk about it for, like, a little bit after. It was maybe, but, like, the next year, they didn't want any No, They didn't want even that, um, those things. What are those things What they were doing? Vegas Strong stuff. They even kind of took that off of everything, you know. It was like they wanted people to forget that that even happened. And that was not right because, you know, 58 people died. And it wasn't right for them to just be like, oh, that just isn't good. We want, you know, people to not think of that because then that would deter tourists. So they just kind of squashed it. They even had the uh, memorial at the Las Vegas sign at first, and then they didn't want that there anymore, so they moved it, you know, somewhere really far away. I don't even know where it is now. Um, and it's not anywhere near for tourists. It's somewhere else. Um, and Vegas just keeps doing that, and you can't keep squashing the negative news and just keep, you know, you can't keep putting, like, Sugar on crap and calling it a donut. You know what I mean? It's like the thing is just crumbling, and they're like, oh, it's fine. And then, like, the uh, Mick Akers over there, uh, our new thing is, like, he's like the guy on the Titanic as it's sinking, where he's just like, it's all good, guys. We're still on course for our destination. It's like it doesn't matter at this point, even if the Raiders Stadium is going to be completed. Where are the people to fill the stadium? I mean, it's like, I don't know how people are just acting like everything's going to be okay when Vegas 
is not going to recover for a very long time, if ever. Entertainment is the last thing to recover after a depression like unless, we just went through. Unless we do something. Anything? Well, what we need to do is we need to be realistic that what's going to happen is it's going to be a slow open back up. You know, like it's going to be one casino at a time and it's going to be a trickle, you know, to get. But, but so we need to be truthful because if we keep like acting like, oh, everything's fine and everything's fine and da, 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 and, oh, don't worry, guys. And, and oh, da, oh, what, you know, Vegas will be exactly the same way. And, oh, you know, we're going to have a full stadium. And we sold all those tickets. And you sold them to, most of them went to the people that are locals that were going to resell their tickets. And now they're screwed. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, a lot of people will default on their payments to someone those says, tickets, too. Someone says uh, that the, uh, entertainment will be the last, but it will be all at once. You know, rebound quicker. Hopefully. That would be good. That, that's good. Yeah, and I'm not trying to be all negative. I'm just saying we have this tendency here to squash any news that isn't pretty. And you can't do that because things happen in life that aren't pretty. And they need to have a voice in a sense because that makes... Oh. The other big thing is this. We need to stop talking. Like We need to talk about... They're like, well, the vaccine... It's one of the reasons why we shut everything down. You know what I mean? It's like, they're like, well, the vaccine's coming, then everything's going to be okay. Well, oh, no. oh, well, the virus was, we didn't need to shut everything down for this virus. If if you've been watching any of my uh, other periscopes this week, I really was talking so much about it, and I'll get into it a little bit too, but I don't want to make it all about that again. But this virus is... A normal flu virus, if uh, even less than a normal flu virus. And what they've done is they've blown it out of proportion. So Jedi Rich just showed me this video on Twitter of a guy on a bus in Florida that some woman called the cops because he wasn't wearing a face mask, which I didn't even know that was like a, something that they were like absolutely requiring anywhere, or a law or something. So the, the cops, about five cops come ripped the guy off the bus very aggressively. I mean, manhandled the guy off the bus because he didn't have a face mask on. I mean, what have we turned into? I mean, that is not the way America was founded, like, to treat people like that. Like, we were supposed to be about, you know, freedom and not have this, like, militaristic state that we're in now of... um where you call cops and nanny patrol and everyone for a, a, not having a face mask on? Are you kidding me? I, I'm, I haven't even put a face mask on. Jeez. We, I was saying that the other day, this woman scouted at me on the bus just because I like was trying to get off the bus, so I came by her chair as I was leaving the exit, and I stood there for a half second longer because the door hadn't opened. And, um... She man, she scowled at me. If she could have, she probably would have called the cops on me. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? This is a normal flu virus. Mm -hmm. If you look at the numbers, what they do is they blow out of proportion one of the biggest numbers. But they, the way they write it, it confuses you. So Jedi Rich just was, saw one this morning, and it says something like, 500,000 affected. But then you read the small print, and it says that the majority of them have recovered. And then the number that have died is way less always. Um, you know, depending on which country that you're looking at, you know, sometimes it'll be in the tens of thousands. Ours is, I think, like at uh, 17 or 18,000 or something like that. People are like, oh, it's growing like a 1,000 a day or 2,000 a day. Uh, if you tracked the normal flu virus every year, it that many people would die. The normal flu virus... About 50,000 people die in the U.S. every year. So if you were to track it like we're tracking this, you would see the same thing. We just don't normally do that. 
And the people that are dying are the people with uh, very poor immune deficiencies and um, the elderly that are very sick, not even the healthy elderly. And those are the people that always die from the flu. And some of them were already about to die before they got this. And then the other thing is they are counting deaths. As anyone, if you have contracted the virus, Let's say you got it and then you recovered, which is a lot of people. Way more people have recovered than have died from this. So that would not make it a deadly virus. If more people are recovering, that would mean that it's one that you could recover from. So it's not that deadly. Deadly would be implied that, like, if you got it, everyone dies. That's what they're acting like. No, that's not the case. This is just a virus that if you're already unhealthy, you could die just like when you normally get the flu. When you normally get the flu, if you were someone that that would be an issue, like if you were already sick, like people that are already in the hospital have cancer, things like that, like John Prine, this uh, this singer that just died, he was in cancer remission many times. He has had cancer for many years, so he's been sick, and he was already sick. And then he got this flu virus, and then he died. So they're like, oh, John Byrne. He was also like 70-something years old. Um, but he was 670-something. So like like my mother-in-law is 75 or 76. I forget what her age is right now. And if she got this, I know she'd be fine because she's, she's so healthy. Whereas, you know, some older people, you go, oh, you know, and you would just know that they would not make it if they got the flu. So it's the same people. Like, what do you think about doctors and their knowledge of what's going on? Well, well for one the thing, industry. for one thing, no doctor right now is going to be the one doctor to really say anything other than like what everyone's saying because you don't want to be the one guy that people go, oh, well, he said this. So it's like everyone's just going to go along with the flow and that's going to be the safest thing because even like Dr. Drew first uh, stepped out about this and he said that about 20,000 would die and that would be about it. It would be less than the normal flu virus and that's what it's coming out to be. I mean, that's what it's looking like. And now he's saying, oh, I was wrong, which he wasn't wrong, so I don't know why he's saying he was wrong. For one thing, he shouldn't say he's wrong until he's wrong. Like, until the numbers get higher and higher, then he could say that. But as of now, he's still right, so I don't know why he's reneging, but so... How I feel about um, the doctors know what they were taught in in school for the most part. You know what I mean? Like doctors learn how to be doctors for many, many years. They go to at least 10 years of schooling, if not more. And then, you know, they do all they do all kinds of on on-site training, you know, um, before they are actually even, you know, a doctor officially on their own. And... Um, they learn a lot while they're doing it. But if anything with nowadays, with how much access we have online, you can educate yourself as much as your doctor, especially on the topic that you are interested in because you have more time than they have to educate themselves on every single topic. So with this coronavirus, this is all new. Uh, it's a new virus, so no one knows too much. So no doctor knows that much about it because it's a new virus, right? But they know about viruses, and they know about trends, and they can see uh, the trend of this virus, and they know about the normal flu virus. But as far as uh, exact details on this one, that's what everyone's finding out right now. So we are all learning at the same rate as the doctors so doctors do not really know any more than anyone else about this particular one, other than their knowledge of medicine and, you know, like, every, like of the body and of viruses and things like that, which might be more than the average. It is more than average. I mean, but it might be more than most, but there are some people that actually know more because they've educated themselves. I'm not one of those people. I don't know that much about viruses. Um... But I know a little bit. And um, I do educate myself on a lot of topics on 
the internet by literally scouring. And you can't go off of just reading, you know, one article and on something. No, you have to read all kinds of things. You got to go to the sources. You got to see where the facts are, not just people's headlines or people's blogs and stuff. And that's what I've done for many topics. So when it comes to um, this virus, I think you should educate yourself. I think you should look it up. Uh, look up real official documents when you're looking online. Don't get on, you know, you can get on little paths of people's nonsense. Make sure you're reading real things coming from professional medical doctors because they are learning this at the same rate that we are. And so the the stuff is coming out, but what's happening is it's getting tainted by this hysteria stuff. So what's happening is the facts, if you read the facts, the facts are saying not that many people are dying and more people are recovering. But then the hysteria news focuses on, they'll pick like the biggest number, like they'll say, 1.3 million affected. But then you come down to the numbers and it'll say, a million recovered. You know what I mean? So they're like, they're the numbers, they're doing these hysteria numbers. And some doctors are doing that as well. And I, uh, I don't know if they personally feel that way or if they're told to do that or if they're uh, feeling for their professional career, they need to go along with all of the other doctors. I don't know what every doctor personally feels um, or thinks about it, but I definitely um, know that if you read the actual facts, this virus is not deadly. More people are recovering than dying. Tom Hanks and his wife are, I believe, in their 60s. They got it. They recovered. They're feeling fine. They've even been talking about that, and it's weird. And people are coming out and doing that, but people are only focusing on this number of people that are dying, which is less than the number of people that usually die from the flu virus every year. Across the world, usually about 650,000 people die from the flu virus every year. And the people that are getting this flu and then they're recovering, they're saying it's not even much more severe than the regular flu, except for that the duration's a little longer, like it might last a little longer. But it's while you have it, it's not anything worse than they've had when they've ever had the flu. And we're acting like, oh my gosh, when people are saying, if you get it, so like we're doing all this, all this panic to avoid getting it. But then the people that are getting it are saying, not that big of a deal. And I recovered. Look at Tom Hanks and his wife. She was doing a rap song that I saw about a week or two ago. This is after she had the coronavirus. And she's in her 60s and she was doing a rap song. It was pretty cool. It was on like TikTok or something. I think I saw it on Twitter. But. Um, yeah, and we only are focusing on these people that already were unhealthy, like very unhealthy. I don't mean just a little unhealthy. I mean like people that were very close to dying um, or uh, very poor immune deficiencies. You know, so any anything they got would have killed them, the regular flu. Or um, the other scenario I forgot that's going on, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, is they are counting... Anything, if you get the virus and you die from anything else, so let's say a car accident or anything, they, I heard a story of some baby got strangled or something, but they, the baby had had the virus, so they count that as coronavirus deaths, even though it wasn't actually from the virus. So let's say you got the virus, let's say like with Tom Hanks and his wife, they got the virus and recovered, but now if like something happened, uh, you know, not, knock on wood, they would say they died from the virus, even though it didn't have anything to do with it. Like, like if they got in a car accident now, they're like, oh, another coronavirus, because they're counting anyone right now. Like, if you have the virus and recovered, and if you die from any other means, they're counting that as a coronavirus, because they can say the person 
got the, got the virus and died. And, and that's a true statement. You know what I mean? Yeah, they died, but it didn't have to do with the virus. You see how you can twist, you can twist things to sound very different, even though you're not technically lying. And the big media is very good at that. And then you have other media outlets that just straight up lie. But you have some that are just really good at twisting the truth to where it sounds very different than what's really going on. And they know that it's going to sound that way because they're trying to kind of skew your opinion. Every writer has their own opinion. They act like they're being biased, but their own opinion comes through in their writing. So whenever, or they're speaking with me, I'm clearly biased. This is all my opinion. This is I'm my blog. I'm, it's my opinion. When a writer acts like it's not their opinion, that's insane because anything, even if you try to just say exactly what the person told you, you still have an opinion of that person when, like let's say you're a reporter or journalist and you got a story and you spoke to someone and you, got, and you wrote down all the facts of what that person said to you. While you were listening to that person, you have an opinion of that person. So when you go to write your article, you're still going to be biased because of just your own personal opinion of that person. So how you write your article will be dependent on your own judgment of that person. Does that make sense? Like, even if it was supposed to be positive or negative, but still your own judgments and opinions are going to come out. It's just how we are. So anyone's article, blog, anything, anyone that a journalist that says something on the news is always going to be biased of their opinion, even if they're getting paid to do it because at the end of the day they chose to do something that they're okay with lying about if it's something they don't feel that is true. You know what I mean? But they are someone that doesn't mind lying. So it's still, you know, biased because they're okay with lying to you. You know what I mean? So you always have to take what people say with a grain of salt and educate yourself. And we have the internet now so you can do that. But like I said... Be very careful about when you look up something, you need to look up a, it a lot so that you know what everyone is saying about it so that you're not just, like, so one-sided. So if you were looking up a topic, say the virus, make sure you're finding what everyone is saying, the people that are in this panic thing. See what they're saying. And all I'm hearing in the panic thing is adjectives. So make sure you're reading the facts. So adjectives would be things just, oh, the worst, the most deadly, da 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 But then where are the facts that are lining up with that? Are more people dying than ever from this? No. Have more people died than recovered? No. Are people recovering? Yes. Have less people died than recovered? Yes. Okay, so why would that be the most deadly? Why would that be the worst virus we've had since the Black Plague? I mean, I'm hearing these things. I'm like, what? I'm hearing just, oh, this, oh, this, this is gonna be like the Spanish flu, and all the. I'm just hearing all these crazy things. For one thing, we've advanced a lot in our knowledge of medicine and things. So, um, and just. The normal person has a better hygiene, um, and we personally take care of our health better health better than uh, necessarily some people did in the past that had no education on you know just very simple things. So when something like a flu came around back then, it could wipe out whole tribes and stuff and colonies and things. But now we just have a general knowledge that's like, we didn't have to do this quarantine to have avoided, I mean, it was going to be the same. People act like this quarantine, we'd be like, 
well, that's why we're only, you know, sitting at the numbers we are because we did so good at quarantine. No, we did not do good at quarantine. I mean, this quarantine thing, is it makes me laugh sometimes because you're like, okay, some people don't go to work, but other people do, okay? Um, but everyone congregates at the grocery store, even though we're not supposed to be in close quarters, and they still say six feet apart. But you, have you been to the grocery stores? Try to keep it six feet apart. The grocery stores are packed, and that six feet rule only applies when there's not people in there. Once there's people in there... <laughs> It's where's the rule? So you're packed in like sardines. So if anyone's got it, I mean, and then you're still allowed to do enough things that like everyone would get it if it was that contagious. Also, you're allowed deliveries all day long, but all those delivery people deliver to everyone. So like, if one person had it that anyone came got, like everyone would get it. You get like it's not that contagious because if it. <laughs> If it was, I guarantee all our delivery drivers would be contaminated because they have come in contact with, like, everyone. And I see the same people time, day after day after day for delivery drivers, for the cashiers. None of them are sick. I mean, all of my local people, I see the same people. The people here at the front desk here, they still have our front desk people here. Our maintenance people are still here. Not, And I, I know people. I'm one of those people. I, I know everyone it's four everywhere hours. I go. And so I know if someone's missing, and not one person have I seen missing in any one of the establishments close to here, and they come in contact with everyone. And, um, you know, uh, we're not seeing very many people getting sick in the hospital either. Like, uh, the, my dad works in the hospital. I haven't heard of anyone. Um, I mean, a couple people, but very few um, actual healthcare providers have gotten sick. You say, oh, they're taking all these precautions. Uh, if it's that contagious, you can get it. Just putting on a mask is not going to help. So the thing is, it's not that contagious, and it's not the most deadly, and you can recover, and it's less severe than the regular flu, and it's killing less people than the regular flu. So no matter what other hysteria things you're seeing those are the facts that you can look i mean those are i'm i'm not just coming up with those go look at any of the numbers look at the numbers that they're coming out of the numbers right. that are recovering the numbers that are dying the num like all over the world look at the numbers and don't look at the who's affected those are the ones they want to focus on they want to look at the biggest number look at who has recovered look at who has died Look at those numbers yourself, because I don't even know that they're changing. I don't know the numbers exactly. So look at them yourself, educate yourself, and ask yourself the question, is this the most deadly virus? Is this killing everyone? Is the, You know, like, ask all of these things. And then you don't have to listen to anybody. All you have to do is every day look at the numbers and say, okay, okay, yeah, I could see that, okay. And if you see... The death toll go astronomical one day. Oh, my. Wow, that uh, joint's wrong. <laughs> Sheesh. Look at that. It jumped up to $5 billion overnight. We all died. Oh, darn. I mean, it's like, so what are you going to do, you know? So you got to live your life, and I hate that they've stopped everything because now, you know what numbers I heard are going up? Is the suicide numbers. Because people are depressed right now. This is bad. What happened, a lot of people at first thought, oh, it's kind of fun, a little time off, all right, I'll hang out, you know. Now people are like, I am bored. I want to go back to work. I'm worried about finances. I'm worried if I have a job at all. Some don't even have a job, but the, even the ones that have one are kind of worried because who knows the aftermath of everything that's going to happen after this avalanche <laughs> stops coming down you know we realize what just happened um well so a lot of people are in fear and fear most people are probably in more fear of their own livelihood than actually of the virus at this point and that's what i'm saying is messed up because they now have messed up our livelihoods more than the virus ever would have like, if the normal virus had come through, we would have X amount of people that had died.
but we all would still have our jobs. We all would still have our regular lives. Now, whether you got the virus or not, you were hugely affected by this for really no reason. So that is why I think it's political, because you say, oh, but, oh, they were just protecting us, and now this is just what the, the aftermath. And No, but see, people like Governor Sisolak here allowed construction to continue during all of this shutdown. Shutdown of all non-essential business, except for construction, and especially the construction of the Raiders Stadium. I am no genius, but I think an NFL stadium could maybe stop for a month or two if there really is a worldwide virus epidemic that is so deadly that we need to stop all business except for pretty much healthcare providers and grocery stores. Oh, and construction. Oh, and also allow landscaping, because we wouldn't want the place to look bad after shutting down for two months. So, you tell me this. Either Governor Sisolik does not mind risking the lives of every construction member in all of Nevada that he thinks all of their lives are disposable. That's what he's saying right now. He's saying those guys' lives obviously don't matter. Construction is more important than all of the lives of every construction crew member in Nevada. Take a cut off. I think so. It froze. Oh. I don't know what happened. No, Mr. I think that happened. How was it going? I don't know what happened. That's all right. I think it's, sometimes I guess we got to restart. Maybe it's good then people go watch the other ones because I can talk forever. Maybe that's the universe telling me to take a break from it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Let's take a break. You guys, it stopped. My scope stopped or something. I don't know what happened. I was just trying to figure out what happened. It just stopped. Like, ah. It's catching me. You guys, look at this. So there's this brand called Joy Rich. And so I'm Joy. And that's Rich. And um, it's pretty cool. So we have, like, all of this stuff with our names on it. Like, it's this really cool brand from L.A. And we bought so much of their stuff on eBay. And it's, it's pretty cool to have a brand that's... And we're married, and to have both our names together, that's pretty cool. Anyways, um, but both of our names also are things like you can be rich, joy. Yeah. So we were talking about the virus. So people are still... Uh, Jerry Rich was saying some of the comments were that people keep looking at the numbers of, like, 500,000 affected. I'm telling you, you're looking at the numbers... Of the, uh, the, like the biggest number of like the affected, but people are recovering. It'd be like if people got the normal flu and recovered. These are the same numbers. We just don't normally document it like this every year. But every year people get the flu. Think about how many people get the flu every year and recover. I don't even know what those numbers are, but I'm sure they're very large of how many people get the flu every year and then recover. I mean, we give the flu shot to people, and often then they get the flu. That's how you get over the flu, and that's what they're going to do with this one. You'll probably eventually get a corona flu shot or something. That's the remedy for a virus is actually getting it and recovering, and then you get immune to it. So... There isn't, like, this medicine they're going to get, like, that's just going to be, like, I don't know. People get these ideas that, like, viruses you can just cure. It's not like that. So I'm telling you, educate yourself. There's so much stuff available online now. Everything is available online. So everything that a doctor learned in school is available online now. Like, just 
there's so much information online so you can educate yourselves on everything so you don't even have to just rely on what you hear from your doctor or what you hear from the news or from the, I mean it's like you can go read about everything I mean anything you can read about and you can read about every side of the coin of the just like you know of everyone's opinions you can read all of the different stuff and you can read the f- official stuff for things so like I said so you're not reading just opinions you can read the you know documented official government things or uh, me- prof- professional medical stuff you know all kinds of stuff online and if you read about this virus you'll see the number affected is probably very similar to what you would see of the normal flu virus. Go check it. I don't know that number, but I know the number they're saying of the normal flu virus, what it, the number it kills every year is about 650,000 every year, the normal flu virus. And in the U.S., the number is around 50,000. The normal flu virus kills every year, and it's always the people that are already sick or have very poor immune deficiencies. Um, or the uh, very sick elderly every year that happens. So if you were to track the normal flu every year, you would be seeing these numbers that we're seeing now. We just didn't track it every year. For one thing, we didn't have social media to this level until now. Like, every year we get more social media, in a sense. Like, there's more apps, there's more people on social media there's just more things out there. There's more outlets every year that keeps getting more than there was the year before. So things are going to spread faster. There's more people talking. There's more um, people stirring all kinds of uh, uh, true and false information out there. So I said you got to look on both sides. Don't just listen to me. Look at what everyone's saying and make your own opinion of what you believe and don't just make your opinion be on like I said the adjectives of don't just go like them and say this is the most this is the look at the actual numbers educate yourself that way and say is this the most deadly have more people died from this than any other flu virus we get every year do that and then you'll be able to answer your own questions Okay, this thing died off again. Okay. Let's let me try, let me switch, let me, I think some, let me switch, let me put my phone on there. Okay. Oh, it's probably just my phone being stupid. Yeah, your phone is like freezing up or something. Oh, it's been doing that all morning, yeah. Oh, jeez. It's out of control. Okay, so I'll, let's see, let me make sure. Try again. It's not crazy that the 8 ended up being better, but I'm so glad we have the X camera. So that was the better thing. Mm-hmm. The X has a better camera, but the 8 is a better phone. Man. They weren't kidding. So, uh, let's see. This is Jedi Joy Blog. my life oh hey guys we're having some technical difficulties over here mm-hmm. we're good okay we uh my phone i have the iphone x which i oh man i have a love-hate relationship with that phone no i i love my phone i always love all of my um apple products i actually didn't want to give up my hat i had the iphone 7 and I did not want to upgrade for the longest time because I just loved it. I had the little one. I like the little ones. I don't like the big pluses. Um, and finally, Jedi Rich, I wanted the 8. He got, Jedi Rich got the, uh, the iPhone 8 Plus. And he got the red one. Um, you know, that, that where they do that red. It's so pretty. And I wanted that one too. And he said, I think they... I don't know they did the small ones in red, I don't remember. But um, he convinced me, he's like, get the iPhone X, get the iPhone X, it's got the better camera. 
I was like, all right, all right. And we had we, we got in the biggest fight over this because I wanted the 8 because I had heard really bad things about the iPhone X. Like, it, it had a lot of funkiness to it. And he's like, get it, get it, get it. So I finally got the iPhone X, and it has been a nightmare. But it has the best camera. Well, I'm sure the new ones are even better, but, I mean, it had the, it has the best camera. So we were just having this discussion that we made the right choice because the camera has been amazing, but the phone has sure right. been a pain. <laughs> but what? But we were talking about that. We were... It was interesting to me. What were we were just talking I about? I know. I'll get back to it. Do you remember what we were talking about, though? Yeah, it did the virus. No, but what about it, though? There's something very, very interesting. Everybody's very interested in About the numbers that people are paying attention to the ones that are... Right. That the high numbers instead of the... I enjoy which one wants to get back to the virus. So... People are paying attention to the high numbers of things like who's affected instead of, and they're saying, oh, it's so many, when those are, who's normally affected by the flu. I mean, if you think about who gets the flu every year, it's a, it's a very high number. I mean, I've had the flu a bunch of times. So you would have been in those numbers that they're showing you now uh, in other years if we had had social media and if we had blown it out to this proportion that we're doing for this one. Those numbers are, if anything, less. Or the numbers that are coming in are less than the normal flu virus numbers that you would see every year. Um, and like I said, I don't know those exact numbers, but um, they're saying that the normal flu kills about 50,000 a year in the U.S. and about 650,000 worldwide. And the numbers for this coronavirus are less than that. You're saying, no, they're higher. No, you're looking at the wrong numbers. Look at who has died. Those are the numbers we're talking about, not who is affected. Those numbers are higher. Who's affected? I don't know the number every year of who's affected by the flu. You'd have to look that up yourselves. I don't actually know that number, but I'm sure it's very, very high. I'm sure it's very similar or higher to the numbers you're seeing when you're saying one point. Three million affected or whatever. I don't know what those numbers. I saw some numbers like that. That's who's affected. That would be the same as the people who got the flu and then recovered. So what's happening is they're blowing out out of proportion certain numbers. And those are the ones that they're getting on hysteria where those numbers would be the same every year. So what we should do is start tracking the flu every year, and then you'll see it's the <laughs> I mean, we already do, but I mean, like... It, What's going to happen is what's going to happen every year now. We're going to, and people are going to realize that we freaked out for nothing. So they're going to be like, oh man, because next year it's going to be the same thing, but hopefully we don't shut down the world again. See, hopefully we learn. But next year you're going to see, oh, there's another virus that comes through and <laughs> this many people die again. Same as the coronavirus. See, this is the flu. Remember, we didn't really have a flu this year. This is the flu. Did we have one in 2019? I don't know. Probably something came through. But yeah, this is the flu. We're in 2020 now. We're in April. This is our flu that would come through every year. But this one, we are just, it's like, ah, we're, we're acting like it's the end of the world. What's interesting is by shutting down everything, we have created like a doomsday thing here when it, it wouldn't have happened if they didn't shut everything down. If we had gone about normal business, X amount of people that normally would get the flu would have got the flu. X amount of people that normally die from the flu would have died from this one. It's not anymore. If anything, the numbers are coming in less. They're less. Less people have died so far from this than the normal flu. And you're saying, oh, that's because we've done all these precautions. No, our precautions are ridiculous. Uh, for one thing, what we do, our precautions have caused it where we have put families all together and then people that have come in contact with everyone else bringing things to the family or the one family member or maybe even several of them going out to a place that everyone is congregating like a grocery store. So if anything, what we're doing is we would be putting the virus in <laughs> certain spots now that would make it more easy for people to be contaminated because instead of people being at work, people are running to the grocery store hoarding stuff, 
still buying up the grocery stores. You can get more supplies than you could, but still a lot of people are still really panic buying, buying more than they need. So it's still hard to get supplies for certain things. And but so then they're spending so much time all together in a grocery store. That is not this makes sense. And also other businesses are still going on, like the Raiders Stadium. So that is why the other reason why I believe the politicians know and realize it's not deadly, like, because they can look at the numbers themselves, too, but that they're using this to their advantage. So there is a virus. Yes, there is a coronavirus, and it's a flu virus, same as we have a flu virus every year. What happens is this year people decided to take advantage of the situation for their whatever political reasons. And the one I believe is they were trying to take down Trump. Because if you all remember, right before this, we were going, Trump was in the process of they were trying to impeach him. And then he didn't get impeached. Remember, it's almost like we forgot that they just tried to impeach the president and it didn't go through. We'll talk about some strife going on between the Republicans and the Democrats and all of those people in office. I mean, they just tried to impeach the president and it didn't go through. So can, you can imagine there's a lot of hostility going on and we act like that didn't just happen. We've only tried to impeach a couple presidents. It's a pretty big deal. And it's like we've totally forgot that that even just occurred. And now... This whole virus thing, oh, also what was occurring right after that was Trump was boasting about the economy, and it was going really well, uh, according to Trump, and um, the uh, stock market was at an all-time high. Now, all I feel that all along oh. these numbers were kind of like we were on a false reality that the economy was going so great, but people were in that belief. I think now we're realizing it was kind of based on falsehood again, just like in 2008 when the house market tanked, when all that was built on falsehood, too. I worked in real estate for about uh, five years, I think. Um, uh, I was not an agent. I um, did. Um, I worked admin, and I was an executive assistant. So I learned all about – I actually was the one that input all of the listings for all of the agents and stuff. Are you a Trump supporter? I am not political. Um, I do not vote. I do not vote. I never have and I never will because um, I do not believe in – not unless they change the voting system completely because I don't, I don't believe in our voting system and I never have. Ever since I was in like elementary school when I learned about the Electoral College and learned that a president could um, not win when he got uh, the popular vote, I thought that was ridiculous. So I did not um, want to vote. So I was like, wait, you can, we could all vote for the president and you could not become president. Or I could vote in my state and they could not even count my vote if it went the other way. Like I was like, what? That, are you kidding me? So I was like, why would I vote? And then I even went into the Air Force. Um, I was all for the country, supporting the country. I just didn't believe in our voting system. So I believe that that should be changed. And the only way you can come about change is by not partaking in the current System. People think that change will occur when they continue to do the system. No, they'll continue to do the system while the pe masses go to it. Change only occurs when you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I even went in the Air Force at 17 right after 9-11. 9-11 happened when I was in high school. I was actually watching it live because my mom always had the news on. And she happened to have it. Well, I think all of the news was kind of showing that happened so what happened is the first plane had gone through and she you know we thought it was an accident and so she was watching that because all the channels had switched to that and then we watched the second one go through live because I was like she's like come join she, I remember I was in my room she yells for me to come in the living room and I watched the second go plane go live and that really really affected me and I cared about our country and I was like I want to do my part so I joined I graduated high school a year early and I went in the air force and I wanted to become a pilot but you have to have a, a college degree to be a pilot in the military. Um, so I thought I would first be a flyer on our AWACS plane, which is our surveillance plane, and then I would get my degree while I was in the Air Force. And that was my plan. But then, as some of you know that follow me, my mom ended up uh, killing herself while I was in the Air Force. So kind of my whole existence changed. You know, you're kind of 
everything you thought you were going for is reevaluated if you lose a loved one, and especially to that level, like a suicide. And so this is very important to me right now when I hear that suicide is going up because um, losing a loved one to suicide is so hard. I mean, it's kind of like something you can't explain because, um, like, I didn't know pain until um, my mom died. Like, I didn't really, like, you know, you thought you knew pain until you know pain. (laughs) And so... um, I don't want anyone else to experience that. And I don't want other people to feel that they need to kill themselves either. Because I have also tried to kill myself um, three times. People people are like, man, you're bad at killing yourself. I'm like, I know, right? And it's crazy because I don't think I should be alive. Because especially the first time, I took an entire, like a, a bottle about like this big, like those big ones that you get from the doctor of um it was only ibuprofen, but it was 800 milligram ibuprofen. And I took the whole bottle because I had a kidney infection and they gave me like this huge bottle because the military gives like, they'll give you medicine if you need medicine. Oh my goodness, too much. And I don't usually do well with medicine, like in the sense of I'm very sensitive to it. I'll tell you another story about that later, but um, so I took the whole whole bottle and I took it because this is the crazy thing. So I grew up religious and I was told to, you know, wait till marriage to have sex. And I didn't. And I thought I got an STD just because I just didn't understand. <laughs> I didn't have anything. I just didn't understand what. It's like 30. I, I created it in my head that I had it because I just thought, oh, my gosh, I'm. And so I, I, I had nothing it had even happened to me. Like, it was nothing. You know, like, I didn't even feel anything. It was just I th- convinced myself I had an STD because I had had sex before marriage. That's how much, like, I just was insane about that. So I wanted to kill myself. I was uh, 18. I was in the military. So I did that even before my mom killed herself was my first attempt. So I've... I struggle with depression so I took a whole the whole bottle and then um I passed out and I vomited all in my sleep like all of the, so when I woke up I was you know just covered in vomit, all through the mattress and everything like I destroyed my comforter mattress everything and I lived but um and then I did that two more times after my mom died um I tried it two more times with the pills and uh again vomited them up and lived but my mom um shot herself in the heart so there's no really um, mistake on that one. Uh, you don't get a second chance for that one. So I feel fortunate that I um, lived. You know, I guess I wasn't supposed to go. I was mad when I woke up. I mean, you're not happy when you live through that because you wanted to die. Now you have more complications. Like everyone's mad at you, especially if you like said you were going to do something, which I did, you know. And then everyone thought you were kidding and then everyone th- you know, and they or they think you're just, you know, the boy that cried wolf kind of thing, you know, until they don't take you serious when you, I actually was serious. So that's why I don't really care because I've actually tried to kill myself. I've been to that point where I was like, I don't want to live. And once you, if you've been to that point, then there's not a lot of things that can scare you in life. So things like this virus don't scare me because I've tried to kill myself before. And I'm not saying I want to die. I, I love life now. I'm just saying you get a different um, opinion of life and death. And when you lose a loved one, um, if, you, if you are allowing yourself to really feel, then you'll have a different perspective of life and death too. Now, some people lose loved ones and they continue on the same path and they just live in sorrow and they act like the person is gone forever. Well, that is not going to be good for you. What you got to realize is the person is not gone and nothing is gone. Uh, anything, your pets, everything. I mean, anything that was alive is still around. We just go to, you know, different dimensions. I don't know exactly where we go. I mean, that doesn't really matter to me. People want to narrow down. The thing is, we don't understand the next dimension. You can't understand something that you don't know. Like, something that, like, they, if, let's say they're trying to explain, let's say, like, my mom. She's trying to explain what it looks like where she's at. But it's something that... It, we don't have on earth. So she doesn't have the words to describe where she's at. So that's why we can't know what the next site is like because 
there aren't things on earth that they can describe it. So there's no point. So we don't need to know because we it would be limiting to use the things we have here to describe to be like, oh, it's like the clouds or it's like this or that. It's limiting when you try to use your own knowledge to understand something you don't understand. Does that make sense? It's kind of a weird concept, but you can't use your understanding to understand something you don't know. That's why you have to be educated on something. Um, that's why you have to think outside of what you know. Otherwise, you can never learn. If you only go off of what you know, you'll never learn anything. Like, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> the more you know, there's a someone said it. I don't remember who exactly said it, but they said the the more you know the more you realize how little you know. Like, as you gain knowledge, you realize, I don't know very much because there's so much out there beyond my knowledge. That's why I say educate yourselves. I don't know much more than anyone else. I only have, know the things that I've educated myself on that you all could do the exact same thing, like in the sense of what's available online. Some things you can't educate yourself of my life experiences, um, but those are still my life experiences, so I'm just telling you my life experience. You take that as you may, and you have to then use the things if you think something I say is helpful, but you have to apply it to your life. You can't do exactly what I did, because that only worked for me. Um, but I will say there are things that we can learn that are common as humans. So things like nutrition, once you understand the human body, then we are all the same. So you can say, oh, that makes sense. So when I speak of things like caffeine. So I've been saying um, our, our challenge is while we're in the shutdown for people to cut out caffeine. I cut out caffeine in 2018, March. Actually, the last day I had caffeine was my birthday, March 24, 2018. And then the next day, we decided to cut out caffeine. It was really funny because I was really hyper on my birthday. I was all jazzed up. And then we were realizing that we needed to cut out caffeine. At that point, we were only doing tea. We'd already cut out coffee because we were... We knew we needed to because I had been reading a lot about it. And I'll tell you guys why in a minute. Why? If you say, why caffeine? I'll tell you in a second. But um, I, I, I educated myself for many, many years. You guys, because if you've been watching my blogs at all, I was bulimic for 15 years. And then I almost died. Another way I almost died with uh, bulimia. Uh, my heart was starting to give out. I, I could barely do anything. Like, I couldn't even walk up the stairs. It was so difficult. So I would have to help me, and then I would have to lay down on the couch for a good 30 minutes to recover after walking up the stairs. Not at this place, but we were in another place on the third floor. Same scenario. And um, it had gotten so bad, and I didn't want to quit bulimia. I kept thinking it was something else. Sarah's just like, it's your bulimia. Because we had already stopped a lot of things, too. We had already stopped alcohol at that point. We had stopped... You know, uh, quite a few things. We'd oh, we'd gone to Atkins. We'd cut out sugar and everything. He's like, "It's your bulimia. You have to stop being bulimic." And I, he had been bulimic too, but then he had stopped. So it was time for me to finally stop. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to. But then I got so sick, and I went to the hospital, and they told me that my my levels, like the, I went there. I just wanted them to check me out, and they checked all my levels. And when I left on the drive home, they called me and they're like, "Get back to the hospital. You're you're." Um, all of your levels are, like, lethal for the fluids in your body. Like, you know, like your potassium levels, everything like that is you, you're going to die um, if you don't, you know, come. They thought I needed to come back immediately, and I ignored them. Went on for probably another month. I was still believe me after that until I just got kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And then finally I stopped. That was in 2015. But I was so sick for the next year was the one of the worst years of my life. I was so sick day in, day out, trying everything. Everything made me sick because I had really messed up my digestive system. And what would happen is everything I ate, I would bloat out as if I was like nine months pregnant, but it was so uncomfortable. It was as if your stomach was going to burst. It'd be like no matter what you ate, if you ate a pretzel, 
stomach would like because it was like this response it was actually I found out it was candida overgrowth but it was from all those years I'd really messed up my digestion with throwing up so like if I didn't throw up my stomach would, would just blow up. but I couldn't throw up anymore like I was forcing myself to not throw up anymore so I would have to just sit there and just in agony and so I scoured the internet that's all I would do because I would lay in bed I would be in so much pain and I would read and read and read about nutrition. Just for a year, I read about nutrition. Everything I could find about nutrition. And I, I tried everything. Like, they would recommend this. They would recommend that. I'd read about everything about bloating. I'd read about everything I could read about bulimics. Anything. I literally read doctor's things just about digestion. And, I mean, I educated myself so much. And that's why now I feel very confident when I tell you guys the things that I know only because I educate myself. Now, there's a lot of things I don't know, and there's a lot of things I could be wrong. But when I do say about nutrition is things that I have tried, and that's when I tell you guys this is what I've tried, and this has worked for me, and this is what I had read, and this is what I know of the human body, but this is what has worked for me. And so that's when I say about nutrition. So now, as I said, take what I say, I got something in my take what I say with a grain uh, of salt because figure out what you need for your body. But as far as caffeine, what happens with caffeine is what caffeine does is it suppresses your senses. So like your hormones. So it really suppresses all your hormones especially. So what happens then is you don't feel as tired and you don't feel as hungry. But you really are still those things. You just don't feel that way. So that's why you feel more energetic. That's why you feel like you don't need to eat. But it's only because it's numbing down your senses, doling down everything. So what happens, why that can be bad is your insulin hormone then also gets numbed down, doled down, whatever kind of word you want to say there where it's kind of like in a chill state. Like what happens when you do coffee is kind of like everything goes in a chill state, so then you can be like, hey, I feel like I got more energy now because everything's kind of just chilling. My body's, like, not working as hard, in a sense. Does that make sense? So, like, everything that was working in your body goes, like, I'm just going to chill, okay? Well, your hormones produce insulin and all kinds of things, but one of them produces insulin, and that's cruising along. When you do the coffee, that stops a little bit. So now your blood sugar rises because that hormone stops producing as much insulin as it was, right? So your blood sugar rises. Well, now your body goes, oh, my blood sugar's rising, so I got to produce more insulin. So it starts the production of more insulin, even though you still had that guy there. He's just chilling. So now once that guy stops chilling, you have more insulin, more than you should have had because now you had the one there he starts amping up again once the coffee kind of wears off and now you have more and more insulin the problem with too much insulin or even insulin period is the insulin is what tells your body to store fat so every time you tell your body to produce more insulin you also tell your body to store fat and go into dormant mode and like hibernation mode. So not only do you have the coffee now telling you to go into chill mode, right? Everything chill, relax, so stop production. So, you know, there's other things that are affected too. I'm just going on the insulin one. But if think of everything kind of telling to chill, then your body thinks, oh, all of these things are out of whack. Let me produce more. Let me, you know, amp up on everything. So it ends up this constant up and down so that's why you are always needing more caffeine that's why you think you need it constantly because your body is constantly in a jolt 
kind of sense, like, like jerking itself, you know, producing insulin, uh, and then you go, oh, let me do more coffee, and then I jolt it again, and then the blood sugar rise, and, like, it's really bad to ever, um, let me turn myself, sorry, I get all turned around this chair, um, it's bad to jolt your body. People think it's good to do these things like, oh, I'm going to shock my system. I'm going to trick my brain. I'm, that's actually not good. Your brain does not particularly appreciate that, and your brain is very smart. So you, <laughs> we think that we can trick our brain, but we're part of our brain. So all that happens is you adapt really quick, and you were the one that tried to trick your own brain so you knew what you were doing so your brain could have really fast because your brain was part of the equation so people go oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna trick my brain I'm gonna do this thing where I fast and then I do this so that you know like in these weird things where I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna do this exercise this day and then I'm gonna do this you know and do all these weird things and they think that and it might ha work for a second but your brain very quickly adapts, and that's why people go, oh, wow, I lost all this weight, and then it came right back, or, or I'm plateaued. Uh, that's because any kind of thing where you're trying to kind of trick your own brain is not going to work long term. And your brain doesn't appreciate that, to be honest. It's like, why? Wait. Also, um, the big deal, what's happening right now, is the artificial stuff your brain doesn't know what it is. So it pretty much treats it as sugar because everything breaks down to sugar. So if your brain doesn't know what something is, so like if you put a substance in your body and it doesn't know what it is, it says must be sugar. So it just starts producing insulin as if it got whatever. It, like, so like the artificial sweeteners, your brain thinks it got a lot of sugar because those are extra, extra sweet. They're actually sweeter than sugar. So your brain still thought it got sugar, even though it didn't have, like, the sugar or the calories or whatever. That's what people go, oh, they're calorie-free. So it's, like, people think that, like, Diet Coke and stuff is, like, just free. Like, oh, it's, it's zero calories. I can just drink those. To Jedi Rich used to drink, like, 12 to 24 sodas a day. I'd be like, if I bought two 12-packs, he'd drink them both. I'd have to buy one, then he'd maybe only drink one. I mean, he drank that much, so he could just... I'd never seen anything like that, but he was also bulimic back then. Um, and it's not free. If anything, I, I said this yesterday, I don't know which is worse, the regular cola or the diet cola, and I almost want to say the diet cola because, like I said, it's sweeter. And what happens is it's almost worse to kind of have this now really messed up system where now your brain thought it got sugar, but didn't get sugar. And now it produced insulin, but then now there was no sugar. See where that's almost worse than just getting the sugar and going through the regular sugar process. So this, all this artificial stuff, I believe my, per this is my personal belief on this stance. What I'm going to say right now is I believe the artificial stuff is one of the biggest causes of obesity because it's the one that everyone thinks they can have as much as they want of. You know, if they think, oh, this artificial sugar-free, sugar-free kind of flavoring, people then go just down that kind of stuff. And I believe that is one of the largest culprits of obesity right now is all of the artificial, everything is artificial flavorings, artificial meats, artificial sweeteners, artificial everything. I mean, everything is artificial. Like, um, all of these crazy, like, if you look at the most ingredients of these things, these packaged things, we don't even, you don't even know the names, what they even mean. That is not good. Like, you should be reading ingredients that you know what they are. Like, they should be things like actual things, like beef apple, <laughs> carrot, not like, like these crazy words, like, like these ones are like, with the X's, all these weird words you'll see in ingredients, you're like, what is that thing? And then uh, you'll see the gum all the time, that just does not sound good, who wants to consume anything that's gum? And all of these things are, um, these ingredients are 
exactly what they sound like. They literally become like gum to your insides. Same with gluten. Gluten becomes like a glue. I like to think of gluten as glue. If you don't understand what gluten is, gluten is basically anything that is that gluey substance, as in breads, as in pastas, as in all that stuff that we like, you know, but anything doughy, gluey, um, bready, all of that is gluten. Now, we say, oh, what about this gluten-free? That's just another new issue that we're going to come with later. You can't just take the same thing, make it from another thing, and think in years that's not going to be an issue. You have to eat food that's real food. Like, you can, like right now they're saying, let me just make gluten-free pretzels or gluten-free bread. Well, now you're making it from another thing that's like, what's this next thing you made it from? You know what I mean? Because you got to avoid those kind of things. You got to be eating food that can be grown and from this earth, like not in a lab, not that we were able to make now in labs. I mean, originally, if you want to be your leanest, meanest, if you want to be like the Jedi. Now, if you don't want to be like us, eat whatever you want. But I'm just telling you from my personal experience, now that I eat this way, I eat, we pretty much just eat all organic beef, organic greens, and garlic. That's what we eat. And we only drink water and sparkling water. That's our treat is sparkling water. Spring water and sparkling water. No flavors on the sparkling water. No limes, lemon, none of that. Just the sparkling water, the the one with no flavor. Um, those flavorings are the, what I was talking about earlier. I actually now, if I accidentally get one with a flavoring, I don't accidentally anymore, but I did like a couple months ago. Not to be too explicit, but it it, it, it gave me diarrhea. It would because I am so not used to it now. So what will happen if you cut that stuff out of your diet, then if you go to eat that stuff again, you will see immediately how much it affected you, but you didn't know before because you were so clouded by so many things, you know. And when you're so unhealthy, you don't even know how unhealthy you are until you get healthy. So now when I get sick, my sickness is so much less severe than how I felt even on a daily basis when I was bulimic. But when I'm sick now, it's so much more drastic than how I feel when I feel good. Does that make sense? So like, But I never felt good before. I all just always felt crappy when I was bulimic. You know, you just always on day of the day just didn't really feel good. Now you get those sugar rushes where you're like, ah, bounce off the ceilings. But, you know, on a day to day, you just didn't really feel good, you know. And that's how a lot of people feel. You just don't feel good. How me and Jedi Rich feel is like <sighs> bounce off the ceilings most days. And then once in a while when we don't feel good, we just feel like eh, more how probably everyone feels on a normal basis. That's our sick. Our sick is like, I'm going to lay in the sleep in a little bit or something, you know, and that's sick for us. Whereas in the past, if we were sick, you know, like we would be sick, sick. Like I haven't been sick, sick uh, to where it was anything other than from my bulimia in a long time. When I get sick now, it's, it's things like um, I sometimes still get chest pain because I'm still getting rid of the stuff of all of the um, damage I did. It takes a long time to recover. See, people want to um, do bulimia and then they want to go to like a three-month treatment program and then they want to think that they're going to be better and that will never work. Um, for one thing, you have to completely change your diet. You can't go back to what you... I cannot eat what I was eating. If I ate what I was eating before, I would probably still have to throw up because I can't digest that stuff. I had to completely change my diet in order to not be bulimic. And that's what people have to do, and a lot of people are not willing to do that. So most people don't recover from bulimia. Most people continue to be bulimic probably till they die. Um... I had a great grandmother that died from bulimia. Uh, it was interesting. My cousin had told me that um, she died from passing out and hitting her head on the toilet. Isn't that crazy? Like while she was throwing up, she passed out and hit her head on the toilet and died. And I remember they would always tell me that while I was bulimic because my family. I was very um, at, at as, after my mom died. I told everyone I was bulimic as far as family. So um, 
people knew pretty early on, so um, they tried to help a bit, not really financially. Like, they didn't send me to treatment. They couldn't, they wouldn't pay for that. But they would try to, you know, talk to me or whatever, but it never really worked. What I, um, what I needed was to do what I did and to learn about nutrition. And then I was finally able to get over bulimia. Because the thing was, I was not going to be okay with being fat. It was just, I didn't want to be fat. And a lot of people, um, struggle with eating disorders because they don't want to get fat and when they've tried to recover they got fat and I see that a lot and then they're very unhappy and then they go back to their eating disorders so what I'm trying to help people is to give you solutions so that you don't only have bulimia or being fat as an option does that make sense that's why I feel very strongly about telling people uh, and I don't mean to lecture, and I don't mean to, you know, tell you what to do, but I want people to know that there's an option other than being bulimic or being fat or just being unhappy or constantly having exercise or whatever the thing is that you're just in constant turmoil with your looks or your weight or whatever. Because looks have a lot to do with your weight. Like, a lot of people don't feel that attractive because their weight, but if they were to lose the weight, they would feel attractive. Even though they might be saying, oh, I don't like this or that, but you'd be surprised how when you take off the weight, most people tend to find themselves more attractive, no matter what other flaws they may feel they have. Like, I have messed up teeth, but I felt more attractive when I was the weight I wanted to be. I accept the things like my messed up teeth. (laughs) A little more. I still don't like them, but you know, you you get. But if you have the weight on top of your other things, then that can be debilitating for people. And people have become more reclusive even before this virus because most people don't feel comfortable in their own skin. Like they don't like how they look. They don't have very many clothes they like to wear. They probably have like one or two outfits that they feel okay in. But if it comes to something where they have to dress outside of that outfit, they don't really feel comfortable. So if they're invited to like uh, a party that they'd have to dress, you know, a certain way or a, or a pool party, most people would avoid. I avoided the pool up until I met Jai Rich. I would not even go so what was crazy about my bulimia was it was a quest to be thin but like a a girl mentioned on here yesterday another girl jumped onto the periscope it was a control thing and it was a a a coping mechanism if, if more than anything else and especially after my mom died so I had gotten to where I couldn't not throw up my body physically I didn't stick my finger down my throat or anything I just threw up I would eat and then I would just open my mouth and throw up it was because it was just it almost involuntary I mean I could control it but it was I couldn't not throw up after I ate like it would be like I could hold it for me but it it was coming up so when I had to stop I literally had to sit there and just like swallow it was the worst thing I, I mean this is very descriptive I don't mean to be but I'm trying to let you guys know that it's a serious thing and people sometimes kind of want to dabble in it and I don't recommend you dabble I recommend you listen to my advice and choose other options because it's not so if one thing is not something you can dabble once you start I, it's very hard to not keep doing it because it's pretty addicting because you're like oh I can eat whatever I want and I'll just throw up and look at that I'm thin but long term what happens is more complications happen so what I was going to say is what started to happen to me is I started to have more things of other um, ailments in other places like I started to get spots all over my uh, skin I had these red spots um, because I was so undernourished And so then I got self-conscious about those red spots. So then I couldn't even wear shorts. I could never go to the pool. I would wear pants even in the summer. This was going on for several years before I finally stopped. I I don't know what had happened. I'd gotten some irritation from doing the bulimia. And then the other thing is my skin would get so dry, so everything was just so rough and dry, and everything was getting achy, and my hair was falling out. And uh, my teeth were getting worse, you know, because that that's probably why they're as bad as they are now, probably from all the years, it, you know, because it's, it's not good on your, on your, uh, 
all the acid, you know, that you eat from throwing up is very, very bad for so many things on your throat. I'd lost my voice. Um, that's why I sing now to try to recover my voice, but I could barely talk. I could not do what I'm doing right now because you guys wouldn't be able to hear me. I was so faint. Um, so the point of all this, not to get into my story, is bulimia will lead to so many more complications of things. Then you have more things you're insecure about at the end of the day, and it doesn't give you the body you want. That's the bottom line. It might for a second, but at the end of the day, what happens is you get a lot of weight in your stomach, and you can never get rid of that because that's where, um, if you're unhealthy, your body will store fat in certain spots, and one spot is always your stomach, your thighs, like under your arms. There's certain spots, and um, those will never go away if you're unhealthy because your body will always keep those reserves. Because it'll say, oh, I don't trust you. Because like I said, your brain knows what you're doing. And if you start doing bulimia, it goes, I know you're going to throw up. So I'm going to keep this reserve. I don't trust you. I don't care. You're not going to get to have that. It's just going to stay there because you like to starve us. And so we're going to keep this fat reserve. And so that's what starts to happen. And you start to get a lot of pockets of fat. And then really skinny other places, like really skinny legs. But then pockets of fat. And you'll see that on some girls. Um... And so then that's not the body that anyone wants either. So the best way to get the body you want is through eating right. There's no diet. There's no uh, exercise you know, that's going to give you the body that you want as well as from eating properly. Eating properly is the best way to get the body you want. And um, that's by I... What ha- worked for me was by eating all organics and primarily organic beef or, if you guys don't like beef, any other organic meat. Um, and if you can't afford organics, start with meat. It's five hours. Meat is what you need to eat. That's why veganism doesn't work. Meat is the best source of nutrition. It has the best protein to fat to carb ratio of anything that you can get for your protein. So any other thing that they'll compare, you're never going to have that great of a ratio. So what happens with a lot of the artificial things too is they have a very high sugar or carb content. If the protein is high, often the carb content will be very high too on a lot of the things that people will do as substitutions. Like they'll say, what about this protein or this protein, the ones that are not animal-based you know, the vegans will have these other ones. But if you always look for one thing, they're always high in the carbs, which that will make you be heavier than if you're doing animal protein. And then the other thing is, like I said, if it's artificial, then you have that whole other problem of your body treating it as sugar and producing more insulin. Um, so the best, best source of Nutrition comes from animal meat. Now you say, well, I love animals. I don't want to eat animals. I don't want to eat dead or, or anything like that. Eat the dead. <laughs> so some people have said, that's like, well, for one thing, everything is living, and especially plants. So if you eat plants, then you eat the dead already. Because when you eat that plant, you kill it. Um, and also, anything in a lab now becomes a real living thing, like Everything is made of molecules and atoms and and organisms and stuff. So once it's something, it's living. We just have a different concept of living. Like we think a dog is more living than a tree often or than your microphone here. But all of these things have molecules and atoms and things which we're all made of the same substances. So, you're, you can gain knowledge from anything. I love talking to my devices and things. And you can call me crazy, but I've done that since I was a kid. I used to play with my dolls, and I had a whole world with my dolls, and I thought I was just being a kid, but now I realize that's real. I mean, because everything is a collective of knowledge. So everything presently living and dead is still within our knowledge pool. So you can speak to the dead. 
Not like you think. Not like this co- totally, like, conversation where you're seeing them and you're saying, I mean, that'd be nice, maybe maybe one of these days, but I haven't experienced that yet. But you know that when you're talking to someone or when you hear what they're saying or you feel their presence, and especially if it was a loved one, that's the easiest because that's who can relate to us the most. But anyone that could speak to you, especially artists, if you do um, any art, you can really tap in to the artists that had died before, especially in that field. And that's what people would call channeling. That's what that is. That a lot of singers channel other singers that have died. And that's how you go, how did that artist completely do that and they were so intoxicated or something? Oh, they were just channeling while they were doing their performance. They were out of it. They just let the, an entity take over. I'm probably a dead one. Um, Another entity is Satan. Another entity is God. Um, there's all of these things are entities. Um, so you can believe in all these different gods. I'm sure they're all entities. I'm sure they all exist, being that people believe in them so strongly. But what happened is people have now created books that aren't necessarily accurate. What happens is you have an entity, let's say, that came to Earth. Let's say a god. And people had that experience, okay? And let's say way back. If we're going off of what the books are saying, right? So everyone has their different God. Be Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, whatever, whoever your person is, right? Um, Whatever happened during that time, now we are only getting like the telephone game story later were because things were written down way after the person existed. So you're getting, like, information that was, remember that game where you tried to tell something and you told someone else, they told someone else, and by the time it came back, it wasn't even the same story. So that's what's happened with a lot of religions. So it was many years later that people wrote about the stories of these people. So what we have now, we don't know if that's exactly accurate. So when people just go right to these old books of old doctrines, that's when we have a problem with religion. Because what you got to do is you got to be in the present. You can't be referring to old books telling you what to do. Because for one thing, those books were written for the people at the time. They're not even written for us. That's why they don't apply. That's why they don't even make sense. That's why they're hard to understand because they were written for the time. They made sense to people at that time. They don't make sense to us all these years later. It's like it's so outdated. And so you have to find out things for yourself. And that's what, as Jedi, we say, listen to your own feelings because those are going to be the most accurate. Those are going to be the ones, not my feelings, your feelings, the ones in your own head, the ones that come from wherever you like that to be, be it God, be it the dead, be it uh, your spiritual, whatever you believe in, karma, conscience, whatever the thing is, the gods, you're not into your atheist and you think it comes from nothing, but whatever puts thoughts in your head, whatever you believe puts thoughts in your head, listen to those. And that's all I'm saying. And those will tell you all kinds of things. They'll tell you most likely that uh, you need to not worry about this virus, that, you know, that you're not going to die. But what your old stuff will tell you is fear. So what happens is we have a conflict of what we were taught and what we know and what we're being told in our own head. And what will happen is you'll hear something in your own head, and then you'll revert back to what you were taught. And you'll say, no, I can't do that. No, that's a bad idea. Oh, no, I shouldn't do that. But what I'm saying is to listen to the thought, not the nanny patrol of your own brain. Now, I'm not saying to necessarily do every thought that comes in your head, um, but do a lot of them. I mean, we tend to knock down all of them. And most of them are good ideas, and most of them, well, actually, all of them are good ideas, but some of them are just thought-provoking. You know what I mean? You might be like, oh, that's a funny thought, but I might not need to act on that. But then other ones you really should. And ones that you wouldn't think, like you're like, 
man, I don't know, that'd be embarrassing or something. Do those ones for sure. Like, if it's something if the only uh, reason why you're not doing is out of embarrassment, definitely do that. Definitely. If something illegal, you know, think that went through maybe a little bit, just because that just might have other ramifications. But still, evaluate the situation. Don't just do it because you're, like, in so much fear. I mean, take everything into your own experiences in life instead of just listening to everyone else does that make sense like don't be like because my parents said this or because my pastor said this or my preacher or my boss or my mom or my dad or whoever grandma and grandpa or boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife go off of what you know and then you won't go wrong I mean because you know what you know and what you need more than anyone else. But like I said, you can be your own worst enemy by blocking yourself. So you'll all these thoughts will come in, and then you'll block yourself. You'll say, bad idea. That's stupid. I don't want to do that. That's now you blocking yourself. And that's what happens with depression. Depression, everything seems like a bad idea. Every thought, yeah, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'm tired. You're just tired all the time. The depression is primarily the best definition is just tired. It's all you are is you're just tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. You're like tired of life. That's what depressed is. And like I said, all of these substances like caffeine, high sugar, alcohol contribute to depression big time. Because not only are they just depressive substances in their own state like alcohol actually numbs your senses same with caffeine but they also make your body produce insulin which also tells your body to basically go into a depressive state it tells it'd be like a bear going into hibernation that's what it tells your body to do so you're like okay uh everything seems like a bad idea if the if all i want to do is just sleep you know what I mean? Because the only I- good idea is sleeping when you're in that hibernation mode. Everything else seems like, eh, I don't want to get off the couch. Eh, I don't want to get out of bed. Eh, you know what I mean? Because you're in that hibernation mode. And so that's why people keep having to jolt themselves with more caffeine, and they think that'll help. And it does for a second. That's the trick with caffeine is you're like, woo, for a second you feel. But that's why a little bit longer you're grabbing another cup of coffee, you know? And the longer you drink caffeine, the more caffeine you end up drinking, too. You know, and then you get stronger. Let me get the double shot, triple shot. I hear people with all these crazy new ways. Oh, it's got five times the caffeine now. It's crazy. And all of, it's not just coffee. You know, it's any of these things, the energy drinks, all of that. Really, beverages are a huge contributor to weight. That's the other thing, along with the artificial, is beverages. Because... The problem with beverages is they instantly um, go into your bloodstream. So it's like instant energy. But the problem with instant energy is then your body didn't use any effort to um, like work it off in a sense. Where like when you eat food, you have to chew it. You have to digest. You go through this whole process, which actually starts to – you start to actually – Start the whole digestive thing even, like, when you first kind of just smell the food and then it, if you give your chance time to s- smell it and then when you start to, you know, put it in your mouth and if you chew, then your digestive process starts going. But when all you do is chug that drink so fast, so many calories, so much sugar, it just goes straight in your bloodstream and then your body just goes, stores it as fat because it, it didn't have any of that process to, like, waste some of the calories in in a sense you know so it's just and that's why um the more beverages you have the like quicker you'll gain weight so these all smoothie diets terrible idea we did that we put on so much weight and we were oh we were we would just like not accept it because we were like this is wonderful it was like having ice cream for every meal smoothies are delicious because all they are is sugar you guys once you take fruit and you compress it 
for about a second, there's that moment where there's still a little bit of fiber. They say if you have the ones, like we had a Nutribullet, they're like, if you drink it really fast, you'll still have some fiber. But still, like I said, it's still going right into your bloodstream. But not too long after, even all the fiber disappears, and now all you have is straight sugar. So if you, have, if you buy a smoothie that's pre-made, you're just buying a sugar drink. There's, it's just sugar. You have not, like, you've lost all of the other uh, beneficial nutrients in there, you know, like the fiber and stuff. You're just going, sugar, sugar. So, um, and juice, oh, my gosh. Juice is one of the worst things you could give your kids um, because all that is is sugar. If you, orange juice, oh my gosh. Orange juice is one of the highest sugar content beverages we have. And it is just straight sugar. And people don't realize that. No wonder why it's so sweet. Anything that's sweet is sugar, you guys. Even if you think it's artificial, your brain is going to treat it as sugar. So if you taste something sweet, I don't care if it says zero calories or sugar-free or whatever, your brain is going to start that insulin process as soon as it gets that sweet taste on its tongue. So it don't matter if you think you're going to be okay with it because, oh, look at this. It's sugar-free, but it tastes just like a candy bar. Yeah, your brain's going to treat it just like a candy bar too. So same, and then like I said with the beverages, so if you could literally, if you cut out beverages, you would probably right there just lose so much weight. If you just switch to water, like instead of every beverage, go for water, you probably would lose so much weight right away. You'd probably notice a huge difference. But then that would be cutting out caffeine because you can't do any beverage but water, not tea, not anything, water only, and you would probably lose weight so fast. I can't predict for each one of you what your body would do, but I'm saying beverages are one of those other areas that we are putting on so much weight without even realizing, and it's it's not that enjoyable. I mean, it's like, it is, but it isn't, you know, but I mean, it's like, eh. you know, if you realized every one of those was causing your weight, then you'd be like, forget it, let me have some water, and if you get tired of water, like I said, sparkling water is a really nice option. If you don't like the flavor of sparkling water, I would recommend to continue drinking it because you'll get used to it, and then it can be a wonderful flavor. And the the thing about it is it has minerals. So that's what you're first tasting that you don't like is the minerals. Um, but those are super beneficial. And any other beverage other than water also dehydrates you. So... You have to drink water on top of it, on, and it's also making you fat. So it's just like it's, it's just like you're working so much harder by drinking other beverages. You should just drink water, and I'm telling you, you be shocked how much better you feel too. Because water, yeah, we are made up of 80 percent water, and most people are pretty dehydrated, especially if you drink a lot of caffeine, because caffeine dehydrates, and or if you have any kind of eating disorder, like I was saying. So if you're starving yourself. Um, or bulimic, if you're bulimic, your water levels are so out of whack. So when I was bulimic, I had to get potassium injections quite a few times because I was bulimic for 15 years. So in that time, I ended up going to the hospital a couple of times because I'd gotten so sick. And while I was in the hospital, they injected me with potassium. Now, they didn't know I was bulimic. They just thought I was like really sick. They didn't know what was wrong with me. And it happened about, uh, I think it was three times, maybe four, I can't remember, three, three for sure. And um, it hurts. So what it is is um, it takes like eight hours, and they inject it in your veins, and it, it's a very slow process because if they do it fast, your uh, veins can rupture because potassium is, I guess, just that intense. And when you get low, you can die. And when um, they're injecting, it's painful. It hurts for the whole eight hours that you're getting that injection. Um uh, it just like it just hurts. I can't even say it's just like ah, and um, these things occur if you continue to be unhealthy. Like your body cannot survive forever on being unhealthy. It does adapt, but there are limits. And if you push it like I did, you will end up 
go into the hospital. I used to pass out. I would pass out. Um, luckily, I am so lucky that three times in Panama, I passed out in the street. But there are so many people there that I got caught three times. But I, it was concrete. I could have fell on the concrete. But uh, three times I passed out when I was there because I was so unhealthy in Panama. We were drinking a lot. So I would just be saying, it was really hot there too, so I would just be sitting there and I would get like headed. And next thing I know, I'd wake up, I'd be on the ground and there'd be you know people all around trying to help me. And then it would have been turned out that I'd fallen and someone had kind of caught me before I hit the floor. Um, and this happened three times. And I continued to be like many years after that. I mean, this kind of stuff would happen, and I just wouldn't stop. Um, and it can get very serious. And so I'm saying this because there's a lot of people that are struggling right now because they're home, especially some young kids that are probably considering bulimia because they're getting so fat right now because they're like, when you're home and you're being less active, you're going to eat more than you normally would and you're going to put it on the weight more because you're not being as active. So I imagine a lot of people right now are struggling. I don't know this for certain because I, I don't know what everyone is doing, but this would just be what I would guess is occurring as more and more people are sitting at home, watching more TV, uh, snacking more. They're probably putting on weight in the last um, 25 days that we've been shut down here. Uh, for me and Jai Rich, we live basically the same. I don't get to go to the casino, so that's a little different, but um, our day-to-day -day stuff is pretty similar because we're always at home. So we're very used to this lifestyle, and our diet is so that you can be at home. You're not hungry. That's the beauty of what I'm talking about is never in my life did I ever feel satisfied with food to where you're like, you could just eat and eat a normal amount, and then go about your day and not think about it again until it was time for another meal. I focused on food 24-7, and I've been that way my whole life because my mom was very weight conscious, so from a young age, it was we focused on food. So all my life, it, I just battled with that. And it wasn't until I started eating the organics that I could actually eat, feel full, and not think about it again Till I could even skip a meal and not think about it. I probably wouldn't think about it till the next meal. I'd be like, oh man, we missed a meal. I'm getting hungry now. It's that awesome. And you and I was someone that overate, you know, bulimics. So to to be able to eat a small amount and stop and feel satisfied is like huge for a bulimic. Um, and I want you all to experience that because. Food should not be controlling your life. I mean, think about that. Food, there's so many other beautiful things in life. Food it should be, like, on the back burner. It should not be the focus. And the other thing that's going on with society is we've made it the focus. We've really made everything be focused around food. People get together for food, drinks, or coffee. So it's always around food. Um, and people that are struggling with trying to lose weight constantly battle with that like especially if they go to family functions and people will force food Jai Rich's mother we cannot go to her house because I have told her about my bulimia I've told her about my recovery I tell her about what I have to eat she will try to force me to eat anything that she has made no matter I say I cannot eat that it will make me sick I cannot I'm sorry I cannot she thinks she gets very offended and she does not understand so we cannot go to her house just for that reason. And that's unfortunate. But sometimes that happens with our loved ones that are older. They don't understand. And if you get to where you understand your nutrition, not everyone will be on your side about it. Most people will say you're wrong, but you'll be doing it and you'll say, I know I feel great and I feel like I look better than I ever have and my body feels great and I want everyone to feel this way, but they don't want to listen. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to do what I'm doing and continue to just say what I'm saying because what happens is a lot of people think that um, I have an eating disorder right now or they think I'm on drugs or they think I just naturally just have this uh, very thin body, which I am would by nature be thin, which we all 
by nature would be thin. That's the catch. See, the reason why we're not is because of this food and these hormones and steroids stuff are making people larger. But by nature, if you eat organics, everyone would be smaller. Not all the same size. Of course, we're not all the same size. But I mean smaller than you are if you're uh, eating all of that crap. You know what I mean? So people tend to be like, oh, I was just born fat and that's just the way it is. But you may have been born fat because your parents probably had poor health decisions and while your mom was pregnant. And so you could be born a fat baby that is occurring now. And then you didn't really have a chance because your parents immediately fed you bad food. So your whole life you were fat. But that does not mean you cannot be thin. Everyone can be thin. Everyone can be thin. Um... And like I said, you're not going to have the same body as everyone, but everyone can be that thin where you feel good, you know, where you're you're like you're in shape, you're able to run, you're able to exercise, you're able to, you know, do what humans were meant to do, not where you have these aches and pains and can't get around and things like that. Um, that's what I mean by healthy, where you – where like I ran yesterday. Okay, I, I, I don't promote running because um, – I, w- I was a runner in high school, and my father was a runner as well. Um, uh, but the reason why I don't promote running is it's very hard on your joints if you do it regularly. But it is fantastic to once in a while just get out there and run. But if you run regularly, it's actually very hard on your joints. Um, I mean, it's good for your heart, but it's very hard on your knees and your ankles and things. So I always recommend fast walking is uh, like the best exercise but people don't want to do that because you don't burn as many calories yet you have to do it longer you know people want to do short things they want to run so you can get it done in 20 minutes but if you really want to do the best exercise to where it's best for your whole body and you're not jolting around would be just fast walking or swimming but uh i was i was walking to walmart and i just got a wild hair that i felt like running and i haven't really ran much in years and i i just started running and it felt really good. Um, and I ran for a couple blocks, you know, and then I stopped because I said, you know, you know, I don't want you know, to mess up my ankles or knees because I can start feeling my knees getting a little bit because I have some knee problem from, like I said, all those years bleeding me because a lot of aches and pains. And I thought I had arthritis all over. Now I'm finding out it was just um, all this crap in there from being unhealthy. You can start to get it out as you get healthy. You know, you can uh, rub it with things, put uh, massage things. A lot of it's just like um, knots and um, like bone spurs and uh, calcium deposits and stuff that you put all over your body when you're unhealthy. And then those fat pockets and all kinds of things. So, um, But the reason why I talk about diet so much is because people are struggling. We have more obesity than ever in the whole world. Not even just the U.S. anymore. We have it all over. So when I was 15, I went to China. And uh, back then, uh, Chinese people tended to be smaller, you know, than Americans. And everything was just so small. I remember I got some clothes for my sister, and it was it was just so small. And she was small, but it still was too small. But they were starting to have fast food over there. Like they had McDonald's. And we ate a bunch of McDonald's because I went with this Christian church group and they had us eat at McDonald's because it was cheap. And it was interesting because you were starting, even this was, gosh, in the 90s, I guess, because I was in junior high. Um, You were starting to see some people starting to get obese even over there, but very, very few, very few compared to the U.S. And so even when we went over there, the people from our trip were larger. We already had some people in our group that were obese Americans. Um, And they were just so much larger than most of the Chinese people. But you could see just from the fast food, um, the people that were at the fast food restaurants, like, buying there were already starting to get heavier, like the the Asian people there. And um, what's happened now is I feel like we've Americanized the world to where we're spreading more of our crappy food everywhere. (laughs) 
like when we lived in Panama, we had all the fast food there. And now it's not even just the fast food that's bad. It's all of this packaged food. And when um, other countries have a little bit, some have higher standards than us, and we find that hard to believe, but like, uh, we think America has high standards. No, like organics have a lot higher standards in Europe. That's why for a long time Europeans have tended to be thinner than Americans as well. But it's starting to catch up with everyone because everyone is getting so addicted to caffeine and getting addicted to all of these um, products that you can now get all over the world that are so packaged, easy for everyone. Um Things like, you know, these bars and drinks and things, you know, you can order online, a package of, they can send you protein uh, uh, smoothies in the mail now and um, protein powders and, you know, and the, all this other people. We used to do all that. We'd do the protein powder. The thing that made me the sickest when I was getting over my bulimia was protein powder in a smoothie. When I would do that protein powder, we tried every type. Like, so every type of, like, protein that they had available, we tried, you know, they had whey, they had all different ones. I isolate, but I don't remember all the ones. They had all these different, I don't remember, but we tried them all. We went to the, um, those, uh, nutrition, um, uh, uh, they have just, like, the protein, those stores that just have, like, the protein mixes and stuff. They're always by the gyms. We went to those, uh, I think it was called Nutrition Rush here, and we tried everything because everything was, so we tried every option that they had available for the different proteins, and I don't even remember what they were, and um, every single one made me bloat like crazy, and I wanted one to work so bad because I was loving doing the smoothies. That's when we were doing those smoothies. So we were doing the smoothies, and then we'd add the protein powder. So we tried every powder, then that didn't work, so then we took out the protein powder, and then we did just the smoothies. Still didn't work. Um, and we tried adding, we added like almond butter, we added um, uh, a tahini. Um, I mean, we were trying so many things with maca powder, um, all kind. We were trying so many things, and th- that is when we got the fattest. <laughs> We were tracking our weight. It was funny. We had a scale. We were track. We don't weigh ourselves anymore, but back then we did, and we used to track all of our calories and stuff. So we've done all that. We track every calorie you eat, and we weigh it and stuff, and weigh ourselves and weigh our food, and we were nuts about it. We'd go to the gym for two hours a day. So we've done it all. Um, but uh, uh, we were weighing ourselves, and then we were doing these smoothies, it's- and we started to notice that our body fat percentage kept going up. And I kept thinking the scale was wrong. I was like, man, because I didn't realize I was gaining weight because it kind of sometimes slowly adds on before you realize. And, like, your weight might not even change that much, but your body starts to structure different. And sometimes, you know, muscle weighs more than fat. So sometimes the scale can be misleading because you don't realize you're getting fatter because you're losing muscle and putting on fat which weighs less, but you start to notice your body not looking as good, and you're like, hmm. And so we were doing that with those smoothies, and then I just kept seeing the fat percentage going up, and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And then we started to look at each other, and we're like, okay, we are getting fat, and we just weren't noticing, because especially if you have a significant other, you'll just sit there and get fat together, and you don't really think about it. And so this was like in 2016, and we were getting... That was the biggest probably I've ever been, which I was still small for me because, like I said, I've always had eating disorders. So, like, when I get fat, it's not that fat because I'm always doing some kind of crazy thing, you know, until now. Now, but now people would probably even say what I say, what I do is very extreme. Um, but I feel what I do is extremely healthy now. It's not an eating disorder. It's an extremely healthy way to live, and it's eating the food that's from Earth. But, um... Yeah, we we started to notice, and then I said, okay, so what's happening is my weight isn't going up very much, but my fat percentage is climbing, 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 and then I was getting, you know, puffy everywhere. And so then we switched to Atkins, I think, at that time. And then we did really well at Atkins, but what we never cut out was the caffeine. See, and that's what most people don't cut out either. And most diets will say cut out caffeine, and people don't want to. They go, I'll do everything but the caffeine. (laughs) And... That's your big culprit because, like I said, it's the insulin. It's the constant um, production of insulin, which keeps telling your body to store fat. And just 
day after day after year after year after year, those are some of those extra pounds you're seeing. And some of the other ones are coming from, like, the other beverages. Like I said, if you're doing smoothies or juices, you know, if you're grabbing those in the middle of the day for quick energy. Quick energy and also a fat ass. That's what happens from quick energy. I mean, that's what you need to think of whenever it's fast energy it's also fast fat that those go together so something like people don't want to eat like steak oh steak's so hard to chew that's why steak <laughs> you can eat a lot of steak before you can get fat people don't understand that people think meat makes them fat Meat does not make you fat. This whole cholesterol thing of like that meat uh, gives you high cholesterol. No, 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 no. That's the other things and they're blaming it on the meat. What's happening is people are probably eating like a bunch of starches, like their potatoes and their milk when they're saying they have high cholesterol and a lot of sugar and other things. My grandpa has high cholesterol. He eats steak, potatoes, whole milk, and tons of cheese and potato chips and bread. And they would probably say, oh, cut back on your steak, Dale. That's what the doctors would say. That's why I say you got to take sometimes what some of these doctors say with a grain of salt because they are only going off of sometimes what they have learned. Unless the doctor is constantly updating his knowledge, like re-educating himself on all the stuff. Now, I get they have some training they have to do yearly to re-educate a little bit, but I'm saying, like, continually kind of updating the information because we're learning every day, especially with nutrition. We learn every day new things about nutrition. Um, as See, the longer we're alive and in this current state where we can study things, the longer we'll have a study of things. That's why when you first tried things, like they tried the gluten and they tried these things, they work for many years and they don't see much of an impact. But come 20, 30 years later, now we're seeing that we have all high, all new high obesity levels across the world. And we're saying, what's going on? People just are overeating. It's not a self-control thing. Everyone is trying to watch their weight. So peop- there's very few people, there's some that do it, but very few people that just eat with no regard, where they just say, I don't give a shit and I'm just going to eat anything. Most people are conscious and are trying to not overeat. So what's happening is other things are becoming factors. Most people are eating what would be considered pretty normal amounts of food and they're still struggling with their weight that's because of what i'm talking about when you eat things that your body doesn't know what they are it's going to produce more insulin because it's going to treat it as sugar because everything breaks down to sugar but what you want is the stuff that takes the longest to break down to sugar and what takes the longest to break down to sugar is animal meat Animal meat is the hardest to digest, which is a good thing if you're trying to get your energy that way. Does that make sense? Now, don't under, there's a difference. Dairy is hard to digest because it messes with your stomach and causes problems. That's different than hard to digest in the sense of just the energy needed. Hard to digest. Does that make sense? You want something to take time to digest because then you burn calories digesting it. You don't want something that you can't digest, as in dairy. Now, that causes other problems. So don't get that confused when I say hard to digest. Those are two different things. But when I say hard to digest in the sense of it takes energy. Beverages are not hard to digest right into your bloodstream. It took no effort. That's why they go straight to fat. Meat, you got to break it down. You got to chew it. You got to then break it down and do that whole process. I don't know the exact process of what it goes through. I'm not that educated. Like I said, I educate myself on some things. Other things I don't find I need to know the exact how it goes into. I just say the digestive process. Um If I want to know, I can go look it up online. It's available to find out anything you want to know about the human body. That's what I'm saying is out there. But as it goes through the digestive process, you want that to be a process. You don't want something that's like instant energy. And that is the 
basically the principle of the keto diet that people, if you've heard about the keto diet, what the keto diet is, the bottom line, is putting your body into ketosis. What ketosis is, is using things, like it's converting things other than what you would normally use, like sugar in energy. So it's converting the protein into energy, which takes longer. That's why you lose more weight doing keto. See, what happens is your body will always go to the easiest option for energy. So if you give yourself sugar or carbs, it's going to always use that. When your body goes into ketosis, it has to start using fat and things for energy and using just the protein that you're giving it, but it then has to start using your fat reserves if it runs out, which it doesn't like to do. It always wants to go to the easiest option, so every time you give it a beverage, it wants that. But in ketosis, you're now in a state where you're really starting to convert the fat to energy, and you're in this really good, like, it's a really good process. People say that you shouldn't be in ketosis for very long, but... When you do a diet like we do, we're always in ketosis. We're always in this just constant conversion of the fat to energy. If we um, don't eat often, then we just burn more fat, and it's just you're in this constant fat burning mode. It's really great, and that uh, the keto diet is kind of on that principle of being in ketosis. And the Atkins was a similar thing, and you can actually get these little strips and test your ketosis levels and stuff. But uh, we used to do that too. But um, if as soon as you give yourself a bunch of carbs, you go right back out of ketosis. So your body will always want to choose the easiest route. And you want to be in a state of ketosis because that's when you're just in the best fat burning mode where you're, you're using just your body for energy more. You're just really in that really good mode um, instead of just going to the, you know, because what happens is when you're ketosis, you don't feel hungry, too, because you've already now rever- you've chose a different option for energy. So you're not constantly going, give me, give me sugar, give me this. You know what I mean? Um, now you go, okay, my body's got to find energy somewhere else. And and at first you might feel tired and, and fight it a bit, but once you're in that state all the time, it's it's fantastic. <laughs> That's why we have so much energy. Because if we don't eat, we just start burning fat for energy. Um, and I've, uh, I've heard a lot of back and forth about that being at ketosis for too long can cause problems, but we've been doing it for years now. I mean, that's basically when you do the all protein, you're you know, constantly in a state of ketosis. Cause if you keep your carbs below, I think like 20 grams a day, you're pretty much in a state of ketosis. Um, and that's what we do. Um, and I feel fantastic. Uh, and I've been doing it for, what, two years now this way. And I've never felt better. And we, you know, once in a while, we'll, uh, we've experimented with trying different things, and then we always find that we feel better this way. Like for a, about a month or two ago, we tried a little bit of organic almond butter. And uh, it was delicious. But, man, we did not feel good after about uh, three days of of having it. Like, we, you know, ate a little bit each day. And we were like, we could instantly start to just not feel as good. We were feeling more sluggish. We were just like, Ugh. and we were getting so focused on the almond butter, too. Like, all I wanted was the almond butter. I'm like, give me almond butter. You know, because it, it was, once again, it was taking my brain because it actually has a pretty high sugar content. Even though we think, oh, almonds, it's good protein. But for one thing, especially once you compress it, the amount of sugar you can get in like a spoonful of almond butter is so much more than if you were to eat the almonds. But even almonds are pretty high in sugar and fat um, per the ratio. See, the ratio you want it to be more protein than fat or sugar and substantially more 
Um, and a lot of these other protein options, it's not substantially more. It's like the ratio is not very good. It'll be like seven grams of protein, but then like three grams of sugar or carbs or something. And then like, you know, uh, whatever the fat is or whatever, you know. Um, and with meat, you'll see uh, really high protein with basically zero carbs and then generally pretty high fat content for most meats. Um, but that's what you want to do is you want to have like 60, 20, 20. So you want like 60% of your food to be coming from protein. And you got to be making sure that 60% of protein. See, what people will do is they'll consider their protein source. Like, let's say they got an artificial protein, like, um, like I said, one of these vegan ones, right? And they're considering that as their protein source. And that's in their 60%. So they go, so, and I'll explain this why this is probably saying. So here's their 60%, and then we have 20% fat and 20% carbs. But this right here should be all protein. If you were doing meat, this would be all protein. So I would put my beef over here, right? Okay? And does this make sense? But my beef is all protein. My beef is, let's say my beef is 10 grams of protein, okay? Let's say my beef is 10 grams of protein. And let's say the artificial hamburger, the, the, the non, non, what do they call them? Non-beef or something, I don't know. They, they have some names for them. Is 10 grams of protein, okay? Let's say they're the same. They're both 10 grams of protein, right? But... We put them over here in our 60%, right? We put them the same because we said 10 grams of protein, right? Those the same, equal, right? Well, that's what people think. But they're not because the 10 grams of protein from the meat had zero carbs. The 10 grams of protein from the non-meat, the, the, the tofu burger, had four or three grams of carbs to that 10 grams. A protein. So now in our 60%, uh oh, we have sugar over here now too, which should have been in our 20%. But we're not accounted for it probably because we're saying, no, that was our that was our hamburger. We're accounted for it over here. See, we're really quickly you have more sugar than you should be having as well as if you have the problem of it being artificial on top of it in your body thinking it's sugar. And producing more insulin on top of it. But you already in its current state, it has more sugar than your meat option. So you say, well, who cares? Well, sugar, carbs are where the biggest fat culprits come from. Cut out your carbs and you will lose so much weight. I mean, carbs are the thing that's what be everyone wants their carbs they want to eat. And they think of carbs as just you know, their pastas and their breads and stuff, but carbs are everything. Like I said, carbs can be in your protein uh, thing that you chose. If you chose tofu as your protein, there's a lot of carbs in tofu. If you choose a uh, uh, portobello mushroom as your protein, I don't even think there's protein in there, but, you know, people will choose that as their, as their hamburger. That's not the same as a burger. You need that protein, the protein is what you need. Protein is what builds your muscles. Protein is what builds all of your body. It's the building block. You need the protein. You, if you live on all sugar, well, for one thing, you're going to be very fat, and you're not going to have very much muscle. And that's what we see more and more. We see people heavier and heavier and less and less muscle tone. So they might even not feel their weight is even that much because muscle weighs more than fat. So the more muscular you are, your weight might actually go up, but your physique looks better. But the more fat you have, your weight might not even be as astronomical, but you just feel, you know, you don't look good. You don't feel that you look good. And you might be like, well, I don't mind the number, but I just feel so frumpy. That's because... You're getting more fat than muscle. And that occurs by not eating enough protein. And that's why you see more and more vegans um, 
uh, uh, first, vegans often lose weight because they cut out the dairy. And they often switch to little healthier options than maybe they were eating before. Like, let's say they were eating fast food, and they go vegan, and they start eating almonds and almond milk and and fruits and veggies and rices and things, you know, that are just, you know, a little bit healthier, and they cut out the dairy. And so they immediately see results. But long term of doing that, you're going to put on weight. And like I said, you might not even see it on the scale because what's going to happen is you're going to stop, lo- start losing muscle and putting on more fat because you're not going to be getting enough protein if you're not eating animals. And I know it sucks having to eat animals if you love animals, but like I've said before, that's a part of life, living and dying, and eating an animal gains their knowledge, and they want you to have that. And for one thing, the animals prefer to go to the next life. Um, because living on earth for an animal is not that most enjoyable for most animals. Some, but very few have like the most fun life here. Ever since we've been here, you know, even if we weren't killing them or caging them, we've taken up so much of the land that most wild animals don't have the experience that they had before all the humans got here. And that's unfortunate, but that is the way the world went, you know, in the sense, um, that's why I think it's really cool that these tiger people are, you know, having these tigers, you know, the show going on with that Tiger King. I hope they let him out. I heard Trump might uh, let him out of prison. I haven't finished the show, so I didn't know the whole story. I knew he, I had seen that he was in prison, kind of, but I didn't know if he still was, because, you know, I only watched, I think, two episodes or something. We don't watch very much TV yet, and I only watched that, like, when I was not feeling good. Now that I'm feeling good, I've, like, barely watched TV. When I was feeling a little bit depressed at the beginning of this, I was feeling a little depressed, because I didn't know what we were going to do, and I still don't know. I mean, we don't have rent this week. Um, We're behind on rent, but I don't know. You know, we're all just trying to just, just do our thing and just keep pressing, uh, do whatever we can do. Um, I try not to worry because worrying doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, action does by at least getting out there talking. Now, doing this right now doesn't make me money, but at least it gets me off my butt and I'm doing something instead of just sulking. You know what I mean? So don't think just do something that makes you money. Just do something and then you'd be surprised how opportunities arise. Like when you're not just sulking and laying around, nothing's going to arise. But when you're like, you know, when you're feeling good, you get out, you might run into someone, you might get a job opportunity if you are out of work right now. Um, you never know if you're just doing something. But I guarantee if you're sitting at home doing nothing, nothing will happen. You know what I mean? So um, I've been doing these blogs because it made me feel better. Um, I'm hoping people are enjoying it. I don't even know. I don't look at the comments while I'm doing it because it's just too distracting. In the past, I did that, and then I just stop every two seconds, and it's just people get off, get you off your track, and then you're you know arguing with trolls and stuff. So I don't know. There could be zero people the whole time. I don't know. I'm um, but. I just come in here and I just talk and it feels really good and I haven't done this in a long time in the sense of I was depressed for quite a few months. Um, And you know, I still struggle with it, but every time I get out of it, I feel as if I'm never going to get depressed again. But I probably will, you know, because it's life just, things happen and depression is not necessarily situational. Now, it might feel situational because it might be like the last straw that broke the camel's back where you're like, oh, I got depressed because of this shutdown. But no, you were already depressed. It was kind of just like this kind of like was the final thing that you made you realize. But one event can never make you depressed. Not even my mom's suicide made me depressed. I was already depressed. That just didn't help. And that just made it even worse. But had I been a not depressed person, um, I could have bounced back probably a little bit easier. I mean, no one does well if their mom kills himself. But I'm saying I can't blame her for my depression for the next 10 years fully. You know what I mean? Because I was already a depressed person. Um But we want to blame things, and we want to put it in categories as it's just this or that. But the reality is most people are depressed right now. For one thing, we've been at war for, like, over 30 years, solid. 
There has not been a year we have not been at war since most of us have been alive. I'm 35, so we've been at, at, and maybe even as over 30 years now, so it's probably been for most of my existence, um, well, all my existence I remember we've been at war. But people think that doesn't affect you, but it, it does affect your country is in a constant state of war. Like, people are dying every day for a war. And we forget about that. We want to focus on the, the couple thousand people that have died from the, a flu virus, which is a normal flu virus. Um, but people die every single day for all kinds of things. And we cannot focus on every death every day because that would be crazy. And we're getting a little bit crazy about that even before this. I mean, it's crazy how many times they'll list off the celebrities that have died on that day. It's like we're getting like these lists of people because so many people are dying that have now been famous because our the amount of famous people is so many. Like in the past, there was only so many famous people. You know what I mean? Like Hollywood was a pretty select group. So when one person would die, it was pretty significant. Like Marilyn Monroe dying, that was pretty significant. Now our famous pool is so big from social media stars to just uh, politicians to, you know, to artists, to singers, to songwriters, to the people behind the scenes. So we're getting to know everyone now that... Every day you could list off how many people have died on that day. But we don't need to live like that. We don't need to live on saying how many people have died, and that's what we're doing during this virus. We are just every day talking about how many people are dying. When more people are living than are dying every day, and especially during this virus. But society always wants to focus on the ones that died. And we have a tendency to focus more on the people that have died than the people that are living even with our loved ones. My family focuses more on my dead brother than the living children. My dad and stepmom have spent their entire existence since my brother died of just the sorrow over the loss of their son and completely ignore their living daughter. And that's what a lot of people do. They're like, oh, oh, my life is over because I lost this loved one and ignore the living ones that are still there. Most people still have some loved ones that are still alive even if you've lost some loved ones. I have a living dad who I barely speak to because he's a dick because he wants to focus more on my dead brother and say that he didn't care that my mom died. So that's what people do, too. And I don't mean to bring up my family drama, but what I'm saying, it's real to me and it's real to a lot of people that we live in a society that we spend more time talking about how many dead artists have died this year and how many people are dying from the coronavirus than talking about how many people that have lived through the coronavirus. Why are we not hearing the stories from all these survivors? The only person I've really heard is Tom Hanks' wife, but tons of people have recovered. But we don't hear about them. We hear about the one 97-year-old man in a wheelchair in an oxygen tank that died who would have died no matter what anything hit him this year. I mean, he would have died this year, most likely. You know, these people, that if they got any sickness, it's nothing to do with this coronavirus. So I'm just frustrated that people always want to focus on the negative fearful things. They want to worry. They want to be depressed. They want to have something be wrong. They don't want it to be that this couldn't be a deadly virus. They want it to be this extreme thing. And I don't know why. Well, for one reason, they might want it to be because now they're mad. If it isn't, then why the hell did we do all of this? And that is how you should be feeling. You should feel really mad right now that we shut down the world for nothing. Nothing more than we have every other year. Nothing more than a flu virus that we get every year that kills the 97-year-old with the oxygen tank. 
that kills those guys every year. And you can think that I don't have a heart because I say, who cares that a 97-year-old grandpa died? But I don't care because I, my, most of my grandparents are dead. I have like one living grandparent. They've all died. They were old, and they weren't even that old. My old grandpa died at 64 from a heart attack. Uh, the other one, she was, my grandma was 70. The other one was 70-something. Um, I mean, they just, people die. My mom died at 46. My brother died at 26. People die. If you make it to 97 and you're on an oxygen tank and you finally die from the coronavirus, I should say you live a damn good life. And we should be celebrating your life instead of acting like it's a tragedy that a flu virus killed you. I mean, do you really want to be living at 97 on an oxygen tank, barely making it by? She's, he's on the next path. He's enjoying himself a lot more in the next life than he was here for all of these people. And it's only the people that have really bad health problems that are dying. And most of them are probably thankful. When you get that unhealthy, you do not want to live anymore because you're in so much pain. Like people that get in, you know, the chemo states and things, they, they don't want to keep going because it's painful. Life is not fun anymore when you're sick every day. So some of these people are like, score, yeah, go to the next life. And if you lost a loved one during this coronavirus, well, then they're still around. Just listen to them because I've lost loved ones and they talk to me all the time. I got all my grandparents, everyone. I got my, my mom. So everyone is dead on my mom's side besides her uh, siblings, but her, both her parents and her grandparents. So everyone on my mom's side is dead. So I never met my great-grandparents on my mom's side. They died before I was born. And then my grandpa died when he was 64, and then my grandma when she was 70, and then my mom died when she was 46. So the only people living in my mom's, like, train, train tree are her siblings. Um, so all of those people talk to me all the time. <laughs> and... Um, I also have a Native American um, relative. My great-grandma, great-great-grandma was full Native American, and that's very uh, special to me. I really like that part of my heritage. Um, so uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so you can tap into all of those things of your ancestors and embrace that. And they're still around, and they're probably trying to get your attention because they know you more than anyone else. And your loved ones are around. They're in another dimension, but they're around and they're able to communicate with you. They just usually you don't know that they're trying to communicate with you, so you freak out. And that's why people trip out on drugs, because drugs is when they're able to communicate really well with the dead, and it scares them. And that's why people get trips on um, uh, on drugs, and because they're actually seeing what's there. It's not fake. They're seeing reality, and that scares them because we can't see a lot of stuff in our current state, especially even with our eyeballs. You can capture more on a, in a camera on a film than you can see with your eyeballs right now with our current state of our cameras. Um, they're more advanced than our eyeballs, some of them. And so there are so many things out there that we cannot see. That doesn't mean they don't exist. And we can't even see things to, you know, small molecular levels unless we put them under a microscope, but they still exist, whether we see them or not. And that's how it is with your dead ones and all of the dead and all, everything, your pets, if you have a pet. Oh my gosh. I named my crock pot Charlie the other day after my dog because I, I had a little Shih Tzu, cutest little guy. Um, it was pretty much my only dog I ever really had because my mom wasn't really into pets. And my dad, stepmom had a lot of pets, but they never really were like mine. And this one I got when I was 16, my stepmom's dog had had babies and Charlie. And I love that dog. It's the cutest thing. But um, when I went in the Air Force, I gave him to my grandparents and they just loved him to death. But they got him really fat because they just would feed him everything. But he was fat and happy, so I was like, my stepmom was mad that they made him fat, but I was like, you know what, he's fat and happy, so I let him, let it just be. But um, he ended up passing away because they just fed him too much food. But 
he <laughs> he was a little piggy dog. He just liked to eat, so he really had to monitor, and my grandpa was just not going to monitor. But I was like, oh, well, I, I, I couldn't take him to the Air Force, and my uh, dad and stepmom didn't give him any attention. So it was either a ton of attention and get fat or, uh, you know, eat right and no one give him any love. So I chose him the grandparents. But uh, he passed away when I was in Panama. And um, I was so sad. I mean, I was more sad hearing that my dog passed away than my uh, grandpa and my uncle. Both of them passed away when I was in Panama, too. And I was way, or not my grandma, my grandma. My grandma passed away and my uncle when I was in Panama. Um, my mom's mom passed away. And I was more upset by it with the dog. So we can really have connection with animals, and, and they're still around. And people think... Oh, that's crazy. Why? Why would that be crazy? Why would we only live for 20, 40, 80, 90, 100 years, and that be the end? With all of the knowledge you gain in those years, then for it all to go to waste, why would that be? Why wouldn't it be that you go somewhere else and then it's a collective? And that's what it is. So... Whether you believe it or not doesn't mean it's true or not. That's one thing people have this weird misconception that if they believe something, they mean they think then the alternative couldn't be true. Like, I believe it to be this way, so the alternative is not true. That's not true. Just because you believe it that way doesn't mean it's that way. It might be. But it might not be. Like, just having a belief doesn't make it true. No matter how hard you believe, it doesn't make it true. It can be true. You get what I'm saying? You can believe in something true. But people can have beliefs in things that are completely wrong. And they can believe so strongly. And it can be completely wrong. And they never see past that. And they die believing one way. And in the next life, they probably get some clarity. But don't fear death. If anything, death should be your friend because we're all going to die. So fearing death, um, you, shouldn't, you should just be at, uh, one with death. Be like, one day I will die. That is the truth. One day you will die in this body, okay? But you'll go somewhere else. But this body will die. But you won't die as a spirit. You will go somewhere else. Everyone believes that somewhere else is some other place. Some people believe you go nowhere, but we go somewhere else. I'll tell you that because I speak to my mother all the time, so I know they go somewhere else. So that I will say... I know for sure you go somewhere else. But where you go, I don't know. Because like I said, how are they going to have the verbiage to tell you what they are experiencing when it's something that we don't know? The next place should not be anything like this place. It should be totally different, right? That would be cooler, right? For it to be just so different. Well, it is. So they can't explain it because they don't have the words. That they can't say... Oh, well, it's kind of like this microphone, but it's like a million times different. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they don't bother because also I want it to be a surprise, don't you guys? Why do we want to know exactly? Let's have it be a surprise party after the next live. What's going on? What are y'all up to? See all your loved ones? Yeah, I got a bunch of them to see when I get there. Same with Jai Rich. She's lost a brother and a father. And grandparents as well. Um, I think all of his grandparents have passed away now. Yeah, all of them, like his, on his father's and mother's side now. Uh, so, don't fear death. That's the bottom line. There's no reason to. It's a part of life. Uh, don't fear eating death, because you do it no matter, even if you try to avoid it. Vegans don't avoid <laughs> eating death. Plants are living. Everything's living. So when I hear that argument, I'm just like, oh. I'm like, are you saying plants are not living when you say you don't want to eat death? That's the argument I hear from vegans. I don't want to eat death. I don't want to eat the death. Of, you know, you're like, are you saying plants are not living? Everyone knows plants are living, right? 
Okay, you might argue with other things are living, like the microphone, but plants are living, right? We can all acknowledge that one, right? Well, don't vegans eat plants? So you're eating death. And then when they say things like it uses more water, I'm like, you think eating animals uses more water than producing copious amounts of plants and almonds and almond milk. Did you know almond milk and almond butter are one of the things that's using so many almonds and almonds use so much water to make them? And then to make almond butter and almond milk uses so much almonds. <laughs> that that's part of the reason we have so many droughts in California is literally just from the amount of almonds they're making in California. And the reason why I say almonds, well, uh, vegans and vegetarians, generally almonds is one of their protein sources. They use it, almond milk, almond butter. They eat almonds. If they don't, that's rare usually, or some sort of nuts, you know. Same thing, nuts use a lot of water. They also are very high in fat. That's the other thing. There's your other one. For example, almonds, you would think great protein, but they have very high fat and very high carb ratio. We were eating almonds up until um, about two years ago. We were eating them regularly. And, you know, we felt pretty good, but we could not get off the last of the weight. We were still, you know, heavier than we wanted to be. And as soon as we cut out the almonds, weight drop, we were like, wow, we didn't realize because we always thought almonds were healthy, but they actually have a very large amount of carbohydrates and sugar and a lot of fat to their protein ratio. That's what you got to look at as a ratio, not just that you can't just look at the grams of protein. You have to look at the ratio. And the thing is, with meat, is always going to be your best because there's pretty much zero carbs in meat. The only time you're going to have carbs is when you add things to it, like your seasonings and your um, uh, uh, sauces and stuff. So don't do that. When I say eat meat, you got to think, this is what, okay, if you're wondering what I cook, I've, I've gone to this before, but... Every meal, pretty much, there's a couple variations, like especially during this shutdown, I'll get into that we've done. But prior to the shutdown, what I cooked every meal was burgers with organic beef, and I use organic rosemary, organic thyme, and organic black pepper. That's the only seasoning, and I chop up organic garlic. So then I, I make the burgers on just the, the skillet, and then I put them on a bed of either organic kale or organic collard greens. So basically we have like a, like a, a salad, but it's just organic kale and collard greens. No sauces, no salad dressing, no nothing, no salt. We put a little bit of black pepper on the um, when I'm making the uh, hamburgers. No added stuff later. Um, just while I'm cooking, I add a little bit of uh, black pepper and the... Uh, um, Oregano, I like to use, sorry, oregano, rosemary, thyme, and black pepper. But I don't always use those, I use whatever I have available. Sometimes I only have, you know, the thyme and the black pepper or, you know, the rosemary, you know, whichever. But those are the only four I ever use. And then um, I put it on, so you have your greens, and then I put some, uh, I, I uh, cook up the um, garlic in the pan with the um, burgers, and I don't add oil. I do not add oil. What I do is at night, I use a cast iron skillet. I oil down my pan just to where it's completely covered, like, with the oil, but no additional, just to where, like, it's, like, lined with oil, but with a uh, um, paper towel and no, like, n to where it's barely glistening, you know, where it's not just, like, soaking with oil, it's barely glistening. And then I prefer to have 93% beef. When it's not available, we have to do the 85, which is pretty high in fat. I don't like that one. I prefer the 93% beef. And then you just get that little bit of uh, fat from the meat and from your little bit on your uh, oiled pan from the night before it comes out when you start cooking. And we make burgers. And that is what we eat every meal, burgers. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, burgers on collard greens or kale. And we're so satisfied. You're so full. 
you, I mean, and it's so delicious every meal. I mean, you look forward to it, even though it's the same meal. It's the most crazy thing because it's so nutritious that your body just desires it. it you don't get sick of it. It's amazing. You can eat the same meal every day over and over and not get sick of it. And the only variations we do, we do uh, bone broth when it's available. I'll get it from uh, Whole Foods. Sometimes they have organic bones, but not very often. And I'll make a bone broth. I put it in the crock pot and let that so for eight hours, and then we eat the bone broth, which is absolutely delicious. Or if they have some kind of beef stew. Um, I, I tend to keep with beef because I found that to be the best for me. When During the shutdown, when they had ran out of beef, I did um, have to cook some organic chicken, and we did some um, wild fish. If you're going with fish, you want to do wild because what I'm trying to avoid is the hormones and steroids and antibiotics and things, and that's what you get when you uh, eat conventional. So when you do organic or wild, you hopefully avoid those things. Like I said, sometimes they still allow for some things, but that's going to be your best bet. Um and we did, uh, we avoid uh, pork for the most part. You know, that one we, I had, I consider it was like, but I don't really like pork. And I avoid chicken for the most part only because they feed the chicken so much corn. And corn has become so genetically modified. And that's what they feed the chickens corn, where I choose for the beef, they do grass. So that's why I like my beef, is they do grass fed. So, uh, because the problem with corn is even if you get organic corn, it's so genetically modified because they've messed up the seed to where there is no original corn seed. And corn is no nutrition anyways. So even they're giving that to the um, chicken and then you're eating the chicken. So it's a chicken just full of corn. It's just you end up then consuming it. So I found I did better with the beef just for that reason it's weird I know that's that's where people think I'm extreme and you might not ever take it to my level so I say just do meat and if you can't do organic do meat and if you're worried about the animals then choose organic options because they treat the animals fairly you can choose all those things humane treatment no cages pasture raised grass fed um you know, all those different things. You can look at the packaging. No antibiotics, no hormones, no steroids, GMO-free, all those things. I choose all of those options. Um, uh, the GMO project, verified, all those things. If you can't afford that, then you do have to know the cheaper meat, they don't necessarily treat the animals as well. So that's what you're paying for when you're paying for the more expensive meat. You're also paying for your health because... It's healthier for you and the animals are treated fairly but you're also now not consuming those hormones and steroids that they're giving to the animals so it's better for you so it's not just for the animals but it's a win-win for everyone the animals are treated fairly and now you're treated fairly and not getting sick so choose me and you will feel better and cut out the caffeine and the dairy and gluten, you guys. Those are the biggest things that cause the most issues is caffeine, dairy, gluten, and artificial stuff. That is what is just, if you cut out those things, you will feel so much better. Dairy, gluten, artificial stuff, and caffeine. If you just got rid of all those, you would notice like drastic changes in your weight right away and just your overall well-being it's not just weight weight is like overall being so i'm saying is you don't want to just lose instant weight that's not good see some diets people just lose a bunch of weight but they don't actually get healthy in the process that's not what this is going to do what this is going to do is it going to take off the weight in a healthy way but you're going to right away feel the differences you might not even right away shed the pounds but you're going to feel better and you're going to feel like doing things, and you're going to feel your um, energy come back and stuff. But like I said, when you cut out caffeine, you might feel tired for a minute. But use this opportunity to sleep if you're not working. Then sleep. Like, cut out the caffeine and sleep. You will get tired. You go, oh, I can't sleep during the day. Cut out caffeine, and you'll sleep during the day. You'll be like, oh, I can sleep now. Because caffeine is what's keeping you up. And uh, I used to not be able to sleep. I was someone that kind of had insomnia and once I got ca caffeine, I slept more than I knew I could sleep <laughs> the first month. I was like, 
I was sleeping so much. Um, and, and that's good. Sometimes, you know, what happens too is when years of caffeine use, we've been going, 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 your body does need a rest. So if you actually give it that rest, it would be really good during this time off. But okay, you guys, I got to get going. I don't even know how, how long I've been talking here. Jared, are you coming? Jared? I don't know where he went. He has to turn this off. Richard? Okay. Okay. I think I'm done. I think I've been talking long enough. Come in. <laughs> Were you feeding the babies? No, I haven't yet, but I'm taking a nap short. Oh, he was napping. I got my tire shorts on. I know, I'm like regular. Thanks for everybody. Please subscribe, please follow. Oh, yeah. Check us out on jayrich.com. Man, I've been talking forever. My butt's getting sore in this chair. <laughs> you, got the, you got the talking shorts. <laughs>